Voice matches my fat face. <laughs> Big show! Let's go! Big show! Welcome to the news! We're Rob was eating. So we gotta go! Go! Hello! Hello, everybody. How are you? You like the new theme song? Ah, it's gonna be pretty, pretty interesting times. Uh, joining in today on the Mega Show, hey, Sketchcraft Mega Show, Brandon Mega Potato James. Hello! Hey, everybody. Hey, Taters is back. Also joining in, been a while, Senior Andy Bond. Andy, say hello. hey yo. Andy, friend of the show. Always talking about games and stuff. Um, Got Andy on to talk about, guess what happened this past week, folks? Ah, Spyro was finally released to all you people out there. And, uh, and so now all my backers know why I don't do stuff. Right, because I've been working on the Spyro game the past year, and I thought I'd have Andy on because Andy, you actually got to play it, right? I did, and I platinumed it within like three days. At least the first one. Wow, Jesus! (laughs) Wow, I'm very jealous. Like I'm like maybe I'll get to play it after I get done making Thanksgiving dinner. Still hasn't happened. So (laughs) it's the uh, interesting thing when you when you make games, you don't have as many hours. To play them, um, Brandon. Let's go in here really quickly, Brandon. So I'm just going to quickly jump right into Spiral, and then we'll talk about other stuff. Uh, I want to get right out the way. It's a big part of my life. So uh, about a little bit, about a year ago or so. Yeah, uh, I got an invite to come do some concept art on a game called Spyro, the Reignited Trilogy, over at Toys for Bob. And I remember telling Brandon. Um, I'm uh, I'm gonna be late with some stuff. <laughs> like, like, you remember, Randy? Remember when I called you up and I was like, "Hey." Well, well, first off, when you called me and said you were late, I wasn't sure if I was the father or not. Mm. If I was having a little baby spud. <laughs> mm. <laughs> no, but yeah, I remember you called me up and you said like, "Hey, you want to hear some wild stuff?" And I was just like. All right, what could it be now in your your craziness of a uh, art life? And you're like, I'm gonna be working on some video game stuff. And I was like, Holy shit! Like that's pretty cool. And yeah, 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 I remember that guy. I also remember going, Ah, how do I tell all my backers <laughs> that things aren't gonna yeah. get done anytime soon? Like, like, and will they believe me? You know, like, because at right. the time I couldn't tell anybody. Like the game wasn't announced. Um. Although I am interested, Andy, when was the first time you finally heard about the game coming out? Like, I think it was, I think it was on IGN, and I think that there was some uh, rumors going around because mm-hmm. they had done the, at least Activision has done the, uh, the Crash trilogy. So a lot of people were kind of expecting Spyro, um, and they just weren't putting the original games up on the PlayStation Store for some reason, mm-hmm. or even on their you know, uh, PlayStation now service. So people were kind of curious on that and they were kind of linking it to that. And then there were some rumors that a company was working on the Spyro, uh, remasters. So that's the first time I heard about it. And then, you know, the official announcement. Yeah. I remember something leaking somewhere around April or something. 
Um, all I know is it, it happened, and I immediately sat back at, at work, and I was like, ah, I'm not going to mention it. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to be the first <laughs> one to go, hey, you know, they, they got – they got it under wraps, you know. These these companies, they they know when things are are out there. Um, but but it was interesting seeing the information sort of like. I mean, I've I've worked on licensed T-shirts now for since two thousand five or six somewhere around there. So like, in in these in these packages, you're generally developing things a year out from release, uh, like in merchandise, and. In those merchandising style guides, a lot of times there's concept art or production art or whatever uh, for spoilers, like characters that people don't know. I remember like when Age of Ultron, uh, we were working on Age of Ultron shirts, like we had vision art, you know, and it was not, no one even knew vision was going to be in the movie. I think that someone did leak something about that. Like, I don't know, it was before, it was right before the trailer came out. And man, these all these company emails go out, you know, from lawyers. They're like, remember your NDAs, you know, like <laughs> remember the oath you took when you, you know. So like on this one, I mean, it was no different, you know. Everyone's just like, don't talk about it, you know. So I'm I'm pretty used to NDAs, folks. Like, like that's the thing too. If I literally like the best way to never get yourself into trouble is don't like guys you can't even like videos you know what i mean you can't right <laughs> you can't you imagine now they'll be like the guy who worked on spiral liked a video that complained about diablo and they're like he hates his own company like i don't guys i don't ah damn it you know like i can't <laughs> you just you, you can't i mean once you start working on things folks you really have to stop being like an engaged fan to an extent you know even now, like, as I talk about the artwork and stuff, I can't, I mean, I can only talk to you about my experience and uh, to an extent. There's things I can't talk about, you know, obviously. And that's just because there are a lot of passionate people out there, folks, and uh, they they love to misconstrue everything you say <laughs> like, <laughs> and try to make certain you never do anything ever again worth the salt. Um, but that being said, uh, so... I took the job, saw what the game looked like, was blown away. I mean, I think it's safe to say, guys, I mean, all around, just as fans, like the Spiral remake, I'm not kissing, you know, Rob worked on it, it's a great game. But, I mean, honestly, it doesn't look like your typical remake, right? Like, it looks pretty freaking amazing for what should have just been, you know, maybe, I mean, we've seen some remasters before, and, I mean, the crash was pretty good. I felt this game was like even a step beyond that. So um, it was hard to say, you know, no, I got to tell my idea. Like, it's not like I wouldn't want to work on a game, folks. It's that you get to a point where I'm managing a few projects and you're like, wow, when you take one on, it's going to push everything else back. You know, Andy, I'm certain when you're playing Spyro, you don't get to play Red Dead, right? When you're platinuming, right? It's kind of like oh, that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I kind of put everything else down for that. Raking the leaves. Well, you're in the desert, right? So you're raking the scorpions, right? Something. <laughs> Shoot, shooting at rocks. <laughs> Trimming the, por- the, the the cactuses, you know? Yeah. Right. right. And so then you wonder, is this worth the trouble? Like, I did some covers the summer before for IDW, and they're great to work with. But I'm like... I don't know if it was worth the delay, like working on these robot things, which they're fun to do, but you just never know. Um, and I, I mean, I actually got a few indie game covers recently that I was like, I don't, I can't do it, folks. But I saw this game. And I'm like, man, if I turn this shit down, like, yeah, man. And the game's, you know, I'm never going to hear the end it, of it. <laughs> it'll be regrettable for sure. Yeah. I mean, Andy, Andy, let's, let's play this game. If I had said, yeah, I totally bailed on that opportunity, wouldn't you be like, I, I lost respect for Rob, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would have actually driven all the way over there just to shake you. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. What the hell? I mean, it's one thing to quit going to conventions. It's a whole other thing to quit. I mean, I guess they're not making a whole lot of remakes from beloved video games often, let alone good ones. So, yeah. So I took the job. 
Um, and it was awesome. Um, but you folks out there should know, and I think you've all realized, Rob hasn't been streaming a whole lot this year. <laughs> uh, Brandon, our, uh, so as a result of working on Spyro, we've lost pretty much all, like no one gets notified now mm-hmm. when I do stream. Right. So, so everyone, if you haven't already heard in the theme song and Andy, Andy hasn't heard it cause now we're recording these separately, but, uh, uh, you got to click the little bell, folks. The the ringy dingy down there in the corner. The little ding. Yeah. So cuz what happens is when you don't when you stop streaming after like, I don't know, 3 fucking days, YouTube goes, "You suck." <laughs> yeah. And they just fucking hit you with the notification no notifications ban hammer or whatever. Yeah. Now, I feel real sorry, guys, for like YouTubers who feel the pressure. They must feel that pressure to like if I if I don't keep streaming, keep on streaming, streaming. If I don't keep on streaming, I'm going to lose everything. Like, because I, I don't care. You know, this YouTube thing is a place to store information for free. That's the way I look at it. Um, I don't have to pay to store all these videos. But, like, I don't feel any... Like, whether I stream once or 365 times a year, I, it doesn't change, like, my work. You know, it doesn't, doesn't matter for me. Um, but I do, it is annoying. I mean, imagine Andy, if you stopped playing on your PlayStation for like a month and it like forgot you, you know what I mean? <laughs> That'd be heartbreaking. <laughs> you log in. It's like, I don't know you. You, you know lost I mean? all your trophy. You stopped. All your you, work. You, you lost your passion Andy. you don't get to play, you know, like <laughs> all your, <laughs> all your you achievements. Your your yeah. Platinum. Yeah. Yeah. Brandon, I mean, you're. Your rainbow, what the fuck do you play? Rainbow six, right? Sure. Right, yeah, your rainbow <laughs> sixes, like, no more bullets, you know? Like, it just lets you play with, I don't know. Like, so it's just, YouTube's a fucking uh-huh. weird thing. So so we lost all of that. Um, and then uh, I rolled out of that into another game project that I can't talk about. So, awesome. Um, now... <laughs> <laughs> Unless I ruin it, I'm gonna be very careful. Why don't we share some of the uh, some of the art really quickly? So this is over on the main Sketchcraft.com, which is really just linked to my art station page. Um, but you can see some of the character art over here, folks. And if you go in here too, you should know I tend to put a lot of the uh, some of the work in progress stuff. So if you're interested in seeing some of the comparisons, now some uh, little wise ass over on Instagram wanted to let me know that Dad is Damon. That's not Roscoe. You know, and I'm like, yeah, I know, like that's Roscoe, but they wanted the spots from Damon because the Damon model didn't have any of them, so they were. But you know, you know, Brandon can't fucking win sometimes with these people, and <laughs> <laughs> like clearly none of us knew that. You know, like I don't know, I I try never to respond, but in my room I'm like, you son of a bitch. So, <laughs> right. uh, yeah. So this is the concept art. Um. Any general questions, Brandon, or, or any about making concept art for games or anything? You guys got any? I got I got a question for Andy. Oh no. Okay. How like so? Rob was saying this is like a uh, this is a remastered game, right? I haven't played it. I've just seen all the behind the art stuff that you've been making forever. Yeah. Did the remastered game hold up to your expectations, or are you <clears> feeling <throat> like there's some things that they could probably hit on the next one, or you would change? Um, that's a good question. So keep it honest. Oh, All right, no. So I don't like the term remaster, especially for something like Spyro, which was a, from the from bottom to top a remake. You know, so that game is a remake. Uh, the uh, Jack and Daxter, whatever they did, that's a remaster. That's how I determine it. So moving on from that, um, it was just as I remembered it. You know, when I put in the disc and I started it up. The first game going from level to level, knowing where the tricks are, knowing what I need to do, it it was almost like super familiar. You know, it was kind of like getting on a bike, essentially. And, Mm -hmm. I mean, so it did live up to the expectation. I knew that it was going to be about the same, and that was fine. You know, I was totally okay with that because that's what I wanted to play. I wanted to play more Spyro. Um, So I platinumed the first one, and then I jumped into the second one. And I don't know, I can't remember the second one too much uh, compared to the first one, but there were some of the boss fights, especially the second one with that 
green dog thing uh, he pissed me off i, I was i was yeah, he like blacked, he blacked out he just he just blacked out and kept i was like this game is i was like this boss is trash why do they have to make it so difficult like i know that they were trying to keep it um you know familiar and pretty much on par with what it was and there were certain things i think they could have upped it a little bit as far as you know maybe some controls but I mean, overall, I was really stoked with it. I'm really glad that they were able to remake it instead of just kind of, you know, up it and say, here you go. I think one of the things to remember with games, especially in the, the mid to late 90s, in terms of balancing um, games, and, and this is just having, I was there when it came out, obviously. Um, but I spent a lot of time talking to the developers when I was like at play. Um, and, and game fan, and even recently, as when I was at E3 with the Mega Visions guys, so like you, I, I meet a lot of these older dudes, like and that worked on these games, and those those games, like even like Spyro Two, that was like made in a year, the whole game from scratch, and you're talking oh, about wow. very like small groups of people, like twenty, thirty people, who were making those games, as opposed to like the hundreds of developers that it take to make something now. Um, and that's just because you know, games were simpler too then. I mean, so like when it came to like balancing, like their QA was incredibly short. And, you know, like it was, I mean, you, I mean, in a, in a 12 month development cycle, uh, I mean, when do you even, I mean, you're talking like it's probably like a dedicated three or four months, maybe, maybe, because even then they still have to go for certification and then ship. I, I don't, like, when you think about how games were made uh, it, in the 80s and 90s, I get it with 2D games, like the 16-bit generation, um, because pixels are immediate. But when it came to those early 3D games, I can only imagine how much of a knocking fight it must have been to even get those games approved, just just in terms of, like, scheduling, writing. Th- think about, I mean, a 3D game is infinitely more complex to make than a 2D game. Like, it's just, it just is. And they were right. developing those engines from scratch, right? Like, there was no middleware, no no physics, you know, engines, no no Unreal 4s, nothing. You know, li- lighting, sound, everything was custom made. And then it had to be, the QA, those dev kits had to be a nightmare. What were they running on? Pentium 2s? You know, like, <laughs> with MMX. Nice. Like, what? I just, I, I that's why, I, to, like, I try to go to E3 whenever I can because I can, I, I seek out the, the guys that were there, the guys and some of the girls. There weren't as many female developers back then. But you do meet a few. But I was hanging out over at the Poly Mega booth last E3, and the guys that created that, they were... Uh, some of the head tech at Insomniac. So they, you know, um, they worked on Spyro <laughs> and just, and, and they came from the 16 bit. So like I was talking to him about the deep space nine game on the Genesis and we brought it up and we're playing it. And the guy's like, I worked on this. How do you, wow, you, you know, I'm like, yeah. And then I talked about the deep space game in unreal. He's like, to go from the Genesis to the unreal one was a nightmare. Just the 3d was hor- horrific to get working. Um, so I just, I just think now, like now, you can make a game and have a playable prototype in Unreal, literally in a week. You know, that's it might have dummy graphics and blocks, blocked characters, but that you could play your rough core gameplay within three or four days, um, with a group of twenty people in multiplayer on Unreal yeah. Four. You know, that's pretty amazing. I don't know how they did it. <laughs> I can only imagine those those people were living there permanently for months, you know? Yeah. Um for 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 myself, I really I really do hope this game is sort of like the benchmark. You know, this one and the crash especially are benchmarks for these I mean they're remasters to an extent, right? There's really no way to remaster a PlayStation One era game unless you just like an emulation. You know, when you take the emulator and you crank up the 4K, um, PlayStation Three level games or two level games are easier because the models are closer. But then I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see if they ever remake Grand Theft Auto Three. Like, well, how will that go? 
Like, <laughs> like, will they, will they have the cardboard hands, the action Kung Fu grips, you know? Right. I, I don't miss that. Um, I really wish Mario 64 was available like this though. Cause I mean, like when you think about it for the longest time, guys, I think we can, all, we're old enough to, I know I am. Brandon and Andy, I don't. But, like, yeah. the benchmark for the longest time was, is it a playable Pixar game? Like, when can we get 3D games to the point where they're, like, Pixar games? And, man, this this would do it. You know, right? Like, if you could show this Spyro game in 1998, people would, it looks, think about it, like, how far graphics have come. This is actually right. better than Bugs Life. When Bugs Life came out in 98, right? So, like, I only know that because I was in basic fucking training. And I was like, we got a break. I was like, I want to see Bugs Life. You know, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> learned, I learned of the lesson of don't overhype Pixar sometimes. Like, it's a fun movie, but well, not their greatest. Uh, but man, that, at the time, we were amazed uh, that Soul Calibur was coming out on a console. Right? Like Soul Calibur. Oh, uh, yeah. Remember Soul Calibur? Fred Dreamcast. The Soul Still Burns, yeah. Well, that was still a year to go, but I mean, they had all that 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 initial coverage, like in Next Generation Magazine. The power, Powered by Power, v, power VR. Ooh, early, pre G Force, folks. So, uh, anyhow, man, so like, I just saw this and I was like, well, this game just looks fucking brilliant. And I just was sort of shocked that development on the game. Like the game's fun because working on the game was fun. I can say that like for certain. So, but there are a lot of challenges. Like, um, I personally can kind of show some of this artwork again. So, like, I personally um, wasn't quite used to like render. Like, it's really weird, guys. Yeah. Like, um, every, a little bit of everything I've done over the last few years sort of like prepared me for what I needed to do on this project in terms of rendering character design using gradient maps, coloring. It was like trying to take all the pieces of the puzzle and then assemble them together, you know? So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of like, you kind of get one thing figured out and then they'd hand you something else. And you're like, I got to work on hillbilly robots. I forgot about those guys, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> how do I make that fun without changing it? You know, so they, they, this was all pretty standard development for me until like the um, the the rendering was a little like it, it it went like this was one of the earlier renders. These norks, this is some of the first stuff, so it had a certain look to it. But by the time I got to the dragons, then that was like, yeah, I got pretty good around there but man that was like right at the end it only took like six or seven months of doing the same thing every day uh for 12 hours a day until you're like i think i got the hang of it and then you're done so yeah yeah that was that um i'm gonna be releasing as much of the concept art as i can over the next couple weeks the last thing i got to do was this giant fucking poster um this right here and this is where yeah that's where they wanted me to they wanted me to do this like the way I did the Game Informer cover or the the Chrono, you know, my uh, multi-character pieces. But man, if this this wasn't the biggest challenge, um, they're making that into a poster, right? I'm still waiting on that. Yeah, you, know, you know, I I'm, I, I know. we have a <laughs> PR department, Andy. You're welcome to uh, ask them directly. So oh, yeah. <laughs> I refer all questions. No, um, I don't know what they're gonna do, um, but. I do know that, like, when it was put in front of me, uh, a lot of artwork in games these days is digitally painted. So, like, they do rough lines, like, really rough, and then they paint. And I there's a reason why um, it's done that way. One, it's way easier to keep everything looking the same. Digital paintings t- tend to, they're less defined by people's hand, personal signature, so they, they get to be a little bit more coherent or co- coherent is not the word um what's the word where they're all alike what's that word <laughs> can't my brain i'm getting older cohesive folks. cohesive thank you say wow tater did it all right two Yay. points for two points for tater i just want to write that write that down i was only half paying attention too <laughs> what's new about that so 
Uh, but they, but this was, you know, this had to be drawn, folks. And man, if that isn't just, it's just, this is a giant amount of time. Like, this was hard. This was hard. So, uh, this took an entire month from concept to finish. And I actually did my initial concept right before E3 went to E3 came back. So the entire month of like the end of June to the end of July was, was this. And, uh, it's just, it took, took a while to get everything on model, make sure all the characters were in the order. They were all sized properly, not too much rendering, not too little rendering, you know, it doesn't look like a lot. I challenge anyone out there to go and draw it, you know, and then go do the flats and then do the colors and then do the highlights and then get it approved all the way through. And then when you're done this background, I painted that too. And then you got to start that, you know, (laughs) and you're like, like, you know, it's funny when you work on something like this, all I see is the audio books I was listening to. Like this right here is Anthony Bourdain's book because he had passed and I was, and then these were like a couple of Joe Rogan podcasts, and this was me yelling at taters, and this was a after a while party. I don't I don't see the blonde in the red dress anymore. I just yeah. see zeros. <laughs> 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 pretty much, pretty much, and and I remember at the time I, I was working on this. Uh, I got the Sonic commission. I'm doing color pencil, and I told the guy because he's on the UK. I'm like. I have this piece I'm working on and I need to stop working on this commission. Like, cause I can't, my brain can't do anything else but this. Um, yeah. You know? And he's like, Oh, what is it? I'm like, I can't tell you, but you got to trust that I'm telling the truth. And when you see it, you'll understand <laughs> why <laughs> I'm not folks. I'm not like some fucking genius artist, man. Like I literally, Everything I do is like maximum effort every time, you know, like it takes a tremendous amount of effort for anything I do um, because uh, it's work, you know, it's just work for me. Um, I, I love it, but it's not, I don't have any special talent. Like this is literally rolling up the sleeves and like, ah, we got to get in here. And that, that was, that was hard. And then plus all these characters I didn't design, other artists did on the project. And you're always you're always worried you're going to be like the guy who fucking drew them poorly, and they're like you ruined my design, Rob. And so you know there's that. <laughs> plus the fans, you know you don't want them yelling at you too much. But I got lucky. I haven't had one major complaint. I got one person who was like, "I hate what you did," and I'm like. No kind of, okay, okay, you know, <laughs> I'll take right. it. I'll take it. No critiques on it. You're just like, screw you. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so I have a question for you, Rob, real quick. Sure. Um, so, wh- how? Like, I know that they had to redesign everything. So did they just kind of give you like a dossier and they're like, here you go, work your magic, or did they like have a specific idea in mind and you kind of had to, you know, bend your artwork a little bit to m- meet that? little bit of both. So what they generally do is they show you, here's the character. You know, you get like a screenshot of the character. Um, if you need a couple, they'll, they'll hand that to you. Um, and then they go, if they have a specific idea, um, they'll let you know. Um, they kind of with the Norks, like they were very specific with the dragons in terms of like the the artisans that the classes of dragons, like each one had a certain flavor. This, this, the swamp dragons had a different from the artsy dragons, which had to be different from the dream ones. And right. that was like the difference between the dream and the art ones was like, everyone was like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> like what is, what is What is a dream? What are dreams? You know? And so, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm dreaming of fucking sleep guys. So, um, but, but then you go and you, you take that screenshot or that, you know, like a, it, when it's a note, it's generally just a couple sentences and then, or nothing. And you have to go and conjure up some ideas. Really, you have to do it on your own. And look, I can't speak for the other artists on board. I can tell you for me, um, if I found that if you just sketch something out and hand it back to them, not a good idea. Like you really, th- this sort of job, you really have to th- not just think about everything, but you really should write things out and figure out what it is you're trying to do. 
then present some some sketches um, that back that data up or sort of expand that out. Or if you're going to sketch and then write some ideas down and then kind of put it, whatever you first present, you need to make certain that you thought that shit through. Because, because what happens is, is they ask you questions like, why did you do this? <laughs> why? Why did you do this? <laughs> right. You know, and if you were like, because it looked cool, that's not going to cut it. You know, you kind of like have to come up with a little bit of like a lore. So you need to understand where the character was, whether it's an NPC, a major character, a minor character, where they are in the area initially in the game. I've worked some of the stuff I'm working on now are for things that have not been invented yet. And so when you're taking something that hasn't been invented yet, you have to then imagine how would it play? If this were the game, you have to create the game in your head and how would it, okay, I wouldn't do this, I'd do that. And then you have to sort of draw around that. It's not, your ability to illustrate at that point is kind of like the least important part. You know, like that's a given. The The most important part is that you're, you're communicating ideas, a specific idea that the character is going to be based around gameplay or personality or both. And that you, they want to know you're not just phoning it in, you know, and not just them, but that's how I'm finding with games. Like there's a strong thinking element to this. And so this is why I really, I mean, when, when, when you, when you find artists who try to almost button click their way through art, like in Photoshop, they use filters and, all the shortcuts and extra brushes and scatter brushes, like they can tell the difference between uh, using techniques to save time and rushing through things. And you can't rush through any of this. Likewise, there are time constraints. There's production lasts only so long. You have to produce a certain amount of art in a certain amount of time. Everyone does, or the project doesn't get done. So, so what, what I try to do is um, you can't get more hours in the day, right? So you have to eliminate the amount of things you're doing. That's it. So uh, I just stop with the commissions, stop with the power prints until you get a rhythm going. And for me, uh, I'd get a rhythm going and then they'd present something I hadn't figured. I did these, um, I'll share them later, but I did these, I did this one with this flying saucer to, and these sh- these goats that were in the flying saucer in the game. And you would think the flying saucer is not a big thing to draw, but it kind of is actually because any which way and that, that saucer is no longer fun or funny or it's too funny. You know, everything's, everything's thought about. Mm-hmm. Everything. Um, once they can see it. But initially... It's generally in this case, it was a picture from the game, maybe an idea, but um, there was virtually nothing when it came to the Dream Dragon. So it was like Obasi and uh, uh, let me see here. Ooh. These Dream Dragons. So like I just put up this one, like these two here, Zekimo. They, these were tough because they just didn't know which way to go in terms of the tone of them, you know? And you only know once you draw things. And the more you draw them, then you're like, oh, we definitely don't want that. And you're like, that was a week I lost, you know? And there's... <laughs> and that that time to stop drawing is fast approaching because there's no more money and no more production time. And then, I mean, everything you draw... Remember, everything you draw, someone has to model that and then rig it. You know, so it's like everything you see on the sketch or the sketch on this little piece of key art <laughs> is is money that's being spent beyond me. Like me right. drawing, that's the cheapest thing they're spending money on when you think about it. Like someone else has to physically go and model it and then they have to animate it. Think of the personality and and not just this game, but I don't know how any game gets made, really, when you think about <laughs> how incredible. Like, they, that's why... This is why, having been a guy who I've backed maybe 37 games, I think, I'm around 30 or 40 games on Kickstarter, a lot of them have done well. Most of them haven't. And that I, the games that tend to do well are guys and girls and developers who worked previously in games. You know, like Banner Sagas and, and uh, Thumbleweed Park. and First-time game developers, mm, 
I, they probably don't make it 80% of the time. And I understand why. Like, when you think about... Did you, did you guys back Battle Chasers? Yep. Uh, no, but I did purchase it once it Boo. came out. <laughs> Boo, Andy. <laughs> Boo. How <laughs> shame on you. Uh, you know what? Sometimes you can't do Kickstarters, but I got it full price. Joe Mad, you got to back him. I can't believe you. <laughs> I can't believe you, Andy. You see, you see what I put up with here, right, Andy? Andy's so, more of a J. Scott Campbell kind of guy. <laughs> no, not at all. Did you buy the Danger Girl game on the PSX, Andy? Like, were were <laughs> no. you there for that? I did. That was yeah. fucking horrible. So, uh, <laughs> No, Andy's more of a Ramos fan. Hey, Shame. I am too. So... Well, but the thing about the Battle Chasers game is that's that's a small studio that made that, you know? That's probably maybe – probably internally they, they have maybe six or eight guys internally full-time maybe. And then, right. you know, freelancers come on and off as they need production. And they were only able to do that because they had just got done making two Battle Chasers uh, – Darksiders games plus the development games they did before that. Like there was that game Dragon Kind. Um, I didn't do that. Yeah, it was a game that never made it, but they were making it for PS2 initially. There's a piece of key art around, some concept art and a key art that he did, where it's like this uh, blonde haired dude, and he's got like a dragon glove, like a glove that's like a giant dragon's hand and stuff. It's pretty cool. And um, He so, loves giant gloves. But I understand why, because like, it's just really hard, folks, you know? It's hard enough for me to do what I was doing. I couldn't imagine having to do the concept art and then model and rig the shit I drew, too. Like, I don't, I don't know. So I don't know. Um, but I do know that Look, man, if this is all the game, this is the only game I ever work on, then I did it, right? So fucking mission accomplished. Let's check that shit off. Right. Like, 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 that's it. I did it. You know, it's actually there. I did the game. And I'll tell you something else. Some of the people I grew up with, most people are supportive, but you do find some of those people, mostly the people I worked with in our departments who, damn, you know, I don't want to say nothing. <laughs> all of a sudden, they're really quiet. Like, where'd all the, huh, they're really there for you when you're failing in life, you know? They're like, oh, Rob, ah. Oh. Look at that guy. He failed. Go support him. You know, but then when you're doing well, it's like, man, he ain't so good. You know, I've seen his art. His hands are flat. You know, like, <laughs> I, I don't like the way you draw hair, Rob. Like, I know. Well, I don't have much. <laughs> and I got Brandon, who has none. So, you know, mm-hmm. like, that's how it works. Um, it's, it's time we tell everybody the truth, Rob. I model for all your poses. It's, it's, the, it's the truth, guys. Mega Tater just does all. I do all the posing. So when... Rob draws someone upside down, legs going every which way, and guns blasting. That's me. That's why all my girls have marshmallow hands now. (laughs) 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 Why are you girls so thick? I'm like, well, Brandon. (laughs) Yeah, I got. I'm like a a peanut butter shake, everybody. You see what I have to work with here, people, right? So, um, any other general questions? I'm going to talk about a different game. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, okay, if we're done with Spyro, I just want to end that. I want to end the segment. We're all done. We're done with Spyro. That's it. No more questions. That's it. We're out. Yes. I think we're all good. Okay, so we'll move right along. One second. Okay. All right, Brandon. What are we going to talk about? Pokemon! Pokemon. The trailer or the game? Dang. The game. The actual game that is out that I own. Mm. Detective Pikachu? No. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know what? I mean, we could talk about the trailer next. We we can. But I'm talking about the Pikachu and Eevee Let's Go game that just came out. That is, I don't know where, based <clears throat> off Andy's definition, I got a little lost. If it's a remake or a remaster, I don't know. Or a remix. Can we call it a remix? It, uh, th- I don't know. They made so many changes to this. I it's, don't know what you want to call it. I'd say remix because it, it has like the feel and slight story of the uh, Pokemon Red and Blue but then it's also like got some of the new X Y Sun Moon kind of feel to it. So it's a little there's okay. I'm just gonna say this. I like it. I love it because I'm a huge Pokemon nerd, which everybody should know by now. I'm a 33 year old man who loves Pokemon. And I'm right there with you. Yeah. And but there's parts of this game that clearly you know it's made for kids younger. Where it's very basic catching stray pokemon in the game is very basic you just throw the ball at them and you hit circle it's very basic so part of me is like ah, rah, rah. but it's i'm made for the youtube generation yeah it's very swing and click but i still love getting the pokemon getting the power-ups changing the names and just going all around so 
I'm happy for now. I haven't had a lot of time to play it between moving and my wife's birthday and then Thanksgiving, but the little time that I have played it, I like it. I'm happy for whatever comes next. So that's my two cents. Well, I mean, it's fun for what it is, but like I said, it's very much for the YouTube um, kid who like their attention span is only like two seconds. Uh, I think the one thing that bothers me the most is the ran like I don't mind the random battles, but I hate that we have to catch every Pokemon in order to get experience if we're not going to battle them. Because I don't need a box full of thirty-five different Pidgeys. You know, I just want to yeah. knock. Yeah. I want there's a quote. Knock them at the experience <laughs> point and move out of the way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I I like this because that it's a remake of Pokemon Red, Blue, Yellow. And Yellow was one of my favorite games until Pokemon Emerald. Um, I was always the kid that really loved the third one of every generation. But it's, I dig it. I like it. I like that, you know, it it, uh, it looks very anime. It matches mm-hmm. the show a little bit more. Yeah. And it's cool that you get to see some of the other characters. Like, I don't know, how far are you in the game? Because I don't, don't want to kind of spoil it for you. Uh, I'm into the second or third town where you get the Bulbasaur. I'll spoil it. Gym. They all die in the end, Brandon. All the Pokemon. <laughs> right. It was all a dream. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's all um, in coma. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you see one of the characters, and they do a callback, which, you you know, you see blue. And I hope to see the character red, because I think, I forget which game it was, but I lost it when I saw him as the champion, which I think it was maybe in Ruby and Sapphire, but... It's it's the small things, and and graphically it looks awesome. I'm really looking forward to seeing what it's going to be like for the next entry because I know that this one was kind of like, hey, it's a mix between the traditional Pokemon game, the Let's Go series, right. and, or the uh, Pokemon Go series, um, but we're making a full fledged entry, and that'll be later. I'm really looking forward to that one. Right, next one. Yeah. It's funny you say that about the, the callback because I, when I started the game, I named my main character Red, and my rival I named him Blue. See, I named him Gary because <laughs> I thought it was supposed to be Gary, and then here comes the character that looks like Gary. Music, everything, personality, but and then they named him Blue. I named my Pikachu Bruh, B R U H Bruh, <laughs> and I put a hat on him, a trucker's hat and a vest. So every time he's about to battle, it goes, "Let's go, Bruh." Come on, bruh. Use that lightning tag, bruh. <laughs> you did good enough, bruh. Nice. So I made him a, a pretty douchey character. So. It's like the character, the guy that made uh, Link my dude in yeah. Ocarina of Time, so everybody sounds super chill. <laughs> yes. How about you, Rob? You enjoying it? You enjoying the game? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, the last Pokemon game I bought was the initial red and blue set. <laughs> I, was I don't actually, even like the way you say Pokemon, Rob. Yeah, well, there's, yeah. No, there's no fun in it. You're just like Pokemon. Yeah, you know. I mean, it was a game that I had been talk. I, I I had heard about when I was working at Playco, as a toy store in San Diego. Uh, I was working there '96, '97 through the '96 Christmas season. '97, um, I started '97 Christmas season through '90. Yeah, '96, '97 into '98. Anyway. Uh, so they were going to initially bring this over to the States and there was a giant fight with Galoob because it was going to, they were going to bring it here and call it pocket monsters. But Galoob had this thing called monster in my pocket and they were like, we're suing Nintendo. So Nintendo just released it as Pokemon over here. Uh, and, uh, I really enjoy the pocket monster title better, but that's just me. Yeah. So when it came out, I was, I was in Germany. Uh, we were down range just doing Training and Giesen. and Not that you guys know, but that's where I was. And so um, <laughs> I went and bought both games, Red and Blue, so that way my buddy could play and we could, he could, because we had a lot of downtime in the Army at the time, folks. We weren't at war. So, so you know, you six hours of fun and 12 hours of just sitting there waiting for shit to do. And I was like, Pokemon. And, man, well, first off, it was tough playing the Pokemon in the middle of the fucking dark. Um <laughs> on those screens because they weren't backlit. But I remember getting that, and every Joe in there was just like, what the hell is that game? You know, like, that's you guys are stupid, you know? 
And by the time I got out the military, everyone had Pokemon Stadium on their Nintendo 64s. Like, like, right. I, there was giant barracks. Like, there was a fight once over that fucking game, man. Like, like, but everyone's throwing money down. My Pokemon can beat your Pokemon. And we had the Monster Ranger. Remember the Monster Ranger games where you put, like, a CD in your PlayStation and it would generate monsters? Yeah, there was I whole, remember. Yeah, a whole group of those games. So, um... I like Pokemon, but ever since that first game, I've been waiting for something like like Breath of the Wild with Pokemon. Like, if you can give me an open world, doesn't, doesn't I don't care. I, I want the graphics art, artistic. I like it, but I want an open world RPG like thing. You know, like the games are all. It's like, like man, I love Link to the Past, but I can only play that game over and over again so many times. And I, I'm luckily with Zelda, they've only done that. I feel like Link's Awakening, which is my favorite Zelda game to this day, plays in that format. Um, the Minish Cap games, which perfected that, plus the Oracle of Ages games, which perfected that. But by the time you get to the, 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 the that format in 3D on the DS with those Phantom Hourglass and the Phantom Train games and whatever, it just felt like boring. And then I got to the, they they did better with that. Uh, the the one on the 3DS was that the um. What's it called? The ages, the dirt. Were you? Uh, were you a, a wall a link between worlds. Link between worlds. Which at first I was like, man, again with the fucking top down thing. But they <laughs> flipped it up a little bit, and I was like, all right, that's fun. But Breath of the Wild is like, okay, that's fucking amazing. Like that's like the best Zelda game since Link to the Past. I couldn't imagine what it would be like if every year for twenty years I got two Zelda games that played the exact same way. Like I. <laughs> So the fact that Pokemon has stood that test of time is pretty pretty amazing from its own fan base, which Brandon and Andy and you guys are super Pokemon people, so um, mm-hmm. that's awesome. But Just like, wait until I get my Pikachu tattoo. <laughs> is it going to be the shocked one? Uh, it's going to... I'll send you a picture. It's a Psyduck, <laughs> right? And his nether, you know. So, nice. um, oh, Psyduck. But, like, I'm also shocked that it's it's taken this long for anything like that to happen. I mean, they've made enough money on Pokemon. They can, they could put, you know, a hundred million into a Pokemon game and make back. it. Yeah. But where are they really going to put it on the Wii U? You know, they had to, that would have sold Wii U, but that would have sold Wii U. It would have, but I I didn't buy a PlayStation two Andy until Grand Theft Auto three came out. And so I sort of feel like there's this weird thing. Like Nintendo can't have it both ways. It can't go, well, we're going to have these exclusive games on our systems, and that's why people are going to come to our system, and then not put an amazing, obvious idea on their exclusive system because, well, there aren't enough people in the systems to justify. It doesn't doesn't work. Right. If you make it, they will come. It, you know, act, 100%. If on the Wii U you had a giant open world, and by the way, the Breath of the Wild was designed for the Wii U, so let's not act like you needed the Switch to make for that to happen. If you had a Breath of the Wild game, that was like with Pokemon on the Wii U. Would you have all bought a Wii U? No, oh, I had I bought two Wii U's already. <laughs> so, <laughs> Brandon, give me a game. Would, would you have bought a Wii U to, just to play it? I don't know. No, you don't know. Yeah, you do. Uh, he would well, have because I'll he's probably. a huge Pokemon fan. And if that is something. Oh, if, if, if the Pokemon would have been on the Wii U? Yeah, if it was yeah. like oh, the yeah, 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 open yeah, world yeah. thing. Zelda, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm trying I to bought, say. I would have bought two of them and played them side by side, one in my left hand, one in my right hand. Yeah, and they could have made, they could have released a, uh, you know, a yellow Wii U with the Pikachu themed gamepad and all the other bullshit. I just, I don't understand, you know, other than they're, I get that there's a level of this, I mean, they're very traditional out there in Kyoto and Japan, um, but they, they got to stop. Like some of these things, they're just throwing away a billion... I think the idea at the time was they do so much in mobile that if they made a game on the on the on the on the console that it would eat into the DS or the mobile sales. But now that you know the Switch is both a mobile system and a console, so it's kind of irrelevant. Um, I also think that not doing that has hurt. Is it Game Freak? Is that that make Andy? Is that mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, Game yeah. Freak? I think not doing that has hurt them from a technological standpoint. I don't think they have the tools. Mm, I don't to know do if it, it would hurt them, just because I mean they're still putting on the 3ds, which has a huge fan base already, or a you know. An no, install no, no, base. no, no, no. I'm talking about their 
tech tools internally. So Nintendo oh, yeah, Nintendo okay. themselves held off from making a 720p game for so long that when they started making 720p games on the Wii U, they had a giant bottleneck development wise internally. They weren't prepared. They they got hit the way companies were getting hit from um 16 bit to 32 bit. So you remember if you guys are old enough to remember companies that you were making, you know, like Square was making an RPG every year with Final Fantasy until right. the 32 bit revolution and it was like bam, you know what I mean? Like like they were just smacked right in the face. And then when they went to develop on the PS2, there was like a 4 or 5 year wait between Final Fantasy 10 and 12. You know? So and that had to do yeah, with the 15 years. Yeah. So um <laughs> I don't get me started. And so like they Nintendo has talked about that. And I got to wonder if Game Freak, they're just internally speaking in terms of their development tools and their pipeline, they just aren't there yet. And part of this, like this game's like a good intermediary to that, but it's too linear for me. Like I did try it. It's fine. It's just, I want a more robust world. Even if it's this top down world, when you think about the, the shit you can do in an Animal Crossing game should also be like that level of interaction and like everyone in the towns and the worlds should be doing their jobs and doing their own things. They should be living. The world doesn't feel very alive to me. It feels like kind of static, diorama, static like a di- like a diorama to an extent. So, and that's it's not a negative. It's just you know, I just think that well, it seems like they haven't grown with their fan base. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah they're good. still very much putting it out for kids, which is fine, but you know, you kind of have to cater to both. So, I mean, I know a lot of people, especially our age that grew up with it, they keep talking about how they want an MMO and this and that. And I don't, I would hate that, but I really do like the open world uh, part. And I, what I would actually like, because I know that, that the, the power of these consoles now can do it. I could totally see us booting up the game. And everybody's going to have a different story because now you get to choose which uh, starting town and, and any of the Pokemon games that they've had. So it's like if you want to start in Pallet Town because that's what you knew growing up, start in there. If you want to start in wherever, you know, from like the fourth, fifth generation, you can start there and then kind of bounce around between all the different generation uh, regions. You know, so you have everything all at once, and then you can kind of see who has what Pokemon, who started with what, and kind of evolved that way. So it makes you feel more like a, a trainer in a lived-in world as opposed to, all right, we're all starting at point A. Right. So, Yeah, I almost wish Game Freak would team up with level 5. Uh, yeah, right? Yeah. What did level 5 make? A Nino Kuni? Yeah. Mm. A billion games, Yokoi Watch. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you, Brian. In Azuma Eleven, if you ever played a soccer RPG, it's pretty fucking awesome. Um, so, bunch of games. Ah, <sighs> so okay. What about the Pokemon trailer, Brandon? Well, okay, I'm gonna. I'll go first. Shut up, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, when you know when I first heard Detective Pikachu, and you told me about it, Rob, before it hit like the whole internet, because usually you got your finger on the polls. I was like, ah, you know, fuck them, fuck this. And, you know, I saw the game, and I was like, ugh. Now, when the trailer came out, I was blown away. I can't lie. I was immediately like, fuck, I'm eating crow on this one. I want to see it. The characters look amazing. The CGI looks on point. The world looks like you're in the world of this. You feel connected to it. It looks dope. I'm excited. And funny. Yes. So, I mean, I wasn't sure right off the bat how I felt about uh, Ryan Reynolds being Pikachu, but right. I mean, tonally, if you're going for the the comedy aspect of it, I, he he knows what he's doing. You know what I mean? He's done enough comedy movies. Um, you know, he's seasoned as an actor, of course. So he's going to bring a life to Pikachu that a no-named actor I don't think would have done. So it gives it more credibility than almost like a straight to DVD type cast. Yeah. You know, it, it looks interesting. I'll probably see it, you know, we'll probably take everybody to go see it, but um, I didn't get a chance to play the detective Pikachu game. Although that is on my list of wanting to play. So I'm fine with it being 
like a a side game. It was almost I took it as like um mystery dungeon games that Pokemon came out with, even though I didn't get into those. I I, I respected it for what it was and Detective Pikachu they they kinda went on a limb, which Nintendo more or less doesn't do. Um so I don't know. I'm excited. It looks cool. I, I heard that there was a rumor, and I heard that there was a campaign that was going on that Danny DeVito, they were trying to get Danny DeVito to be the voice. No, well, was, I mean, the uh, internet was complaining, but, you know, someone at, we had, when we were doing the GameCraft stuff for a while, um, someone was asking at the time, Rob, what game, video game movie would you like to see made? And I said, well, I guess if I could only pick one, it'd probably be Pokemon. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, but I was like, if I had to make a billion dollars, see, see, if I had to pick one that I knew could be successful, because we haven't had a seriously successful one, that'd be the one I do. Except for me, it's really simple. It's Karate Kid meets E.T. It's like a boy, (laughs) his pet, and a tournament. (laughs) You know, like, it's kind of an easy movie to make, man. And then they announced, because Pokemon Go came out, and then they were like, we're going to do a Pokemon movie. I was like, here we go. And then they're like, we're going to do Detective Pikachu. And I'm like, God damn, Game Freak. You know, like, I just, <laughs> I knew that when Legendary went out to get that thing, they were thinking Karate Kid meets E.T. And then Game Freak's like, we're doing Detective Pikachu. And then I was like, fuck. You know, so then I see the trailer and I'm like, I bet you the way it's set up, they could backdoor themselves into a tournament film as a sequel. Mm-hmm. You know, like. Like, this might be the smarter way in that if you build a relationship between the Pikachu and the kid and they go on some actual meaningful adventure before they get into a wild tournament movie, then the stakes are elevated. So I'm hoping that's the way they go. If they literally try to turn this just into a series of, like, detective films, and as much as I love myself some Sherlock Holmes, um, colossal fucking waste. Of, of money and time. Um, yeah. Visually, I love the look. Of, I'm glad they kept the Pokemon looking like Pokemon. I think some people complain that there's fur on them. I'm cool with that. Can't. They're supposed to have that. A lot of them do have fur. When I, was, when I was yeah. a kid in that Turtles movie, the first one came out, there was a group of my friends who were like, where's the turtle van? Where's Bebop and Rock City? How come down their belts they don't have their letters? You know, shit like that. I'm like, I don't fucking shut up. So uh, it, it looks like the turtles, you know. You want some shit that don't look like it? Go watch the Resident Evil film sometime. Like get back to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those people that complained, we, that's how we got Turtles Two and Turtles Three. So thanks a lot, people. I had friends who were like, "April Neal's ugly." The first Turtles movie. I'm like, she's what? What? You know? And <laughs> and someone fucking heard that and recast. Um, what's the actress name? Judith Hogue. Judith Hogue, I think. They recast her and put some... I don't know who the fucking woman was in Turtles 2, and I can't remember because she didn't have any personality. And and I remember watching a, a making of thing. Not like It was right when it came to HBO, like a year after, 92. And they're like, yeah, we felt the producers thought, you know, she was prettier. <laughs> it's like they weren't even hiding it. I was like, these son of a, son of a bitch. You know, so... Um, I'm look. They've kept the look, and what I also like too is it takes place in a fictional town. It's not like I was really afraid they were gonna He-Man this movie, where it's like Pokemon come into the real world, like the Smurfs. Yeah, you know, uh, where you're like Dungeons and Dragons. It, it right. I don't know. Um, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so well, so like what you were saying back to you know playing it off into uh, you know like the tournament saga is essentially. Quick question for both of you. Do you think that every trainer hears his Pokemon talk like the kid does in the movie, and then everybody else just hears the standard Pokemon name in the movie or in, in all? It's just like in general, you know, because there was like, even so. in the anime, they're always talking to like, "Hey, Pikachu," and Pikachu says whatever. I think they can understand. Right. I think they can understand the inflictions in the different way they say their name, as far as just attitude. But I don't think they can understand like a full on link like a full on psychic link of like, Oh, he's saying like, Hey, I want to go eat some burgers. But if he's just like, says Pika one way and he says a different way, it means like he's sad or he's happy or he's angry. So it's like star Wars. Everyone knows what R2D2 says. I don't know, Andy, why you gotta go so deep with it, man? It's just a bunch of <laughs> like animals fighting each other with make believe right? kid friendly <laughs> dog fights. Let's go. Jeez. Yeah. That's what yeah, I was saying. You gotta go yeah. deep with the conversation. <laughs> Look, guys, at the end of the day, where does Superman put the boots? <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. That's true. 
The boots. Where are they? He wraps them in his cape. Where are they? The fucking boots. They're, they're in a compartment inside the phone booth. Okay. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. So you know, like I remember when I was. I love the rockets here. I remember the first time my dad saw a trailer for his pants would catch on fire, and I'm like, you fucking dick. You know, <laughs> then my dad would watch fucking Rambo, and I'm like, he would come on, you know, like <laughs> he'd get a staph infection with that when the when the thing went through his leg, and like 24 hours he'd be dead, you know, like, it was stupid. So uh, I love Rambo, but it was just funny. Like you let it go because you know who cares. Um, where where I I just think that the tone seems to be seems to be right, and everyone else that was complaining just pretty much passionate. There's everyone wants a great Pokemon movie. Except for those monster rancher fans, they're like fuck and Digimon. <laughs> the Digimon. <laughs> I want the Yu-Gi-Oh movie with the real Yu-Gi-Oh hair, like you know, as is, you know, <laughs> yeah. with the That's zigzags. How we get things like Dragon Ball and Last Airbender. Okay, Rob. I would love a Dragon Ball Z movie where guys are really roided. They just get those bodybuilders and give them some crazy <laughs> wigs. <laughs> Can. Uh, I... Can the I Bat like and the, the Sun guys – hold on, Brian. Let me finish. Can the Bat and the Sun guys get on that? Can they just get a bunch of those super, like, bodybuilder dudes <laughs> and put them in wigs and do it? <laughs> oh, man. That would be awesome. Brandon, what are you going to say? No. That's, it was that really was... fucking important. You had to say it. So say it. <laughs> I was going to say, jokingly, how much I already love the live-action Dragon Ball movie, but – Ooh, I did not like it. I get the guy confused. The guy they got to play Goku in that movie. I get him confused with that guy who took over that '70s show. Like, isn't, remember, isn't the, isn't the guy from the Dragon Ball movie the guy from Break the kid from Breaking Bad? No. no, Aaron Paul. That's not Aaron Paul. <laughs> no, I thought that was Aaron Paul. Come on, man, bitch. Aaron Paul was in the Need for Speed movie. Remember that? Yeah, what a video game movie that was. And it came no, out right after it. Breaking Bad ended, so they're like, he keeps on driving, like, into the need for speed. <laughs> I was like, wow. That, that would be amazing if they could keep the same character. But that guy looked like your oh, Let me see. No, he didn't. He, he had, like, an elfy face. He looked elfish, just like him. Elvish features. I'll bring it up, man. That guy, yeah, Justin Chatwin. What he else was like he him. in? He was in War of the Worlds... The Ooh. Invisible Chips. Uh, <laughs> but he looked in the movie, his face he looked he looked like Aaron Paul. He looks like him. That looks nothing like Aaron Paul. No. Hold on, I'm gonna go to images. That looks like douchebag Elijah Wood. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he kinda has the same face in that promo post where he's holding the ball as Aaron Paul. He kinda has that look, but I do this like is like the time, Brandon. You should tell Andy your theory about Wolverine. Who should play Wolverine? Your face. Come on, tell Andy. <laughs> All right. Now, in context of it, Kay, have you ever seen uh, and fuck, you put me on the spot, Rob. Damn you. Uh, horns. Have you seen Horns with Daniel Radcliffe? Oh uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Did you like it? It was okay. It was okay. Okay, but Daniel Radcliffe was a badass in it. He's not going to be Wolverine, dude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, See, uh, Andy Daniel Radcliffe. That is not Wolverine. Andy, I, I want you Wolverine. to hear my theory on this. My theory is Wolverine's the guy that steals your girlfriend. And I don't That's fucking right. see Daniel Radcliffe, all as Harry Potter as he may be, pulling off that move. You know, like unless he he's he's Daniel Radcliffe and he's like. I'm not only Wolverine, but I was also Harry Potter. Maybe. Hey, like, <laughs> it's, the, it's the ones you don't expect that creep on you. You know, you, know, you stole like my heart, Brandon, too. but my wife's still ain't too happy about it. But I'm you. trying to say, just Daniel Radcliffe doesn't have that about him, no matter how hard he tries. You know, It's like Sean Astin. He, he's short and stocky, but, you know, eh, I don't see it. Brandon insists. You, you, you call that guy douchebag Elijah Woods. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's like a guy you run to at Seven Eleven. You're like, "Fuck you, handsome motherfucker," <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I guess he kind of has. I guess him and Aaron Paul have that squattish anime face. I Those guess. intense eyes, man. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah, it's all right. Let's move on. 
Yeah, it's an amazing. Let's let's let's, let's get sad or happy, depending on what topic you pick. Uh, let's see here. It's, Andy it's can't see the one. document, so he can't pick nothing. Andy, do Andy. you want to talk? Oh, Andy, we got to talk about Stanley. All right, so let's talk about some Stanley. Uh, Andy, have you met yeah. Stanley? I have not. No, all the cons you went to, you never once got to meet him. I actually never had a desire to meet him. <gasps> you know, I, My best dead point. <gasps> Stanley, I, I'm going to say some things, and I don't feel like it's going to be. No, well, not on this cast. You don't do that. So we'll move I mean, on. it's not going to be a Bill Mayer or Meyer or whatever. I'm not going to trash the guy, but uh, you know, I didn't feel the same way everybody else felt. You should go read the deposition he gave during the Jack Kirby versus Marvel thing. The, the family won, but Stan was very – man, Stan was trying, and the Marvel lawyers weren't having it. Like, it was it was bad. So um, I met Stanley on accident in 19 <laughs> – Brad, I'll tell, I'll tell this inside. Brad, have you met Stanley? Uh, no, I have not, and I – you know, it's kind of like Andy was saying. It's like, I think he's a legend. I think he was amazing. But I never had that need to, like, go pay the $100 or $200 to take a picture with him kind of thing. It was more like I respected the guy from afar, but I didn't – I don't ever would spend the money that people have spent to, like, meet him and be in his presence. If it would have happened naturally, that would have been awesome. I'm, I'm curious. Or something. I'm curious. When was your first – Andy, what was your first con- – what year was the first convention you ever went to, comic convention? Uh, oh my god, 2009? 2000, right. Yeah, 2009. Right, Brandon, what was your um, first? Two, probably 2009 ish, right around the time. I think as me and Andy met each other around that time, when we at least when I first started doing cons, give or take. So after yeah, Spider Man, right? When did I, I don't know, what year did I meet you, Rob, at a con? 2007. Okay, so I started then before that, then 2000. Six two thousand seven ish, but after the first Spider Man movie, right? Probably, yeah, probably. That's two thousand one. So here's the thing: like before ninety nine two thousand one, Comic Cons weren't like they are now. Like you, you didn't stand in a long line to meet too many people. The longest mm-hmm. line I ever saw at Comic Con was the Image Booth and Bob Kane in ninety two and. You know, the image guys were generally a little bit of a long line, maybe a couple hours, a couple hour wait, mm-hmm. maybe. Uh, around 2001, when Spider-Man was getting ready, when Spider-Man had come out at San Diego Comic-Con, that's when it exploded. Like, I, I had to wait eight hours to not get into a room. It never happened. I started going around 92, 91, 90, 92. It was, yeah, 92. That was the first, that was when Batman Returns came out. I wanted to go before then. My father fucking wouldn't let me go. But the first one I was finally able to go to was Batman Returns because I told him the creator of Batman would be there. So, which you know was half truth. Um, anyhow, uh, so at San Diego Comic Con in the nineties, I'm gonna say around ninety three, ninety four. Um, it had to be ninety three because DC had just so DC's booth the year before was fucking horrific. It was just this like bland hall with desks. It's fucking lame. It's a DC like, um, it was bad. And then in 93, when the death of Superman came out, they got the shit kicked out of them financially because Image had come out. Image was there at that con. They debuted. They were like, it was like Hollywood. It was crazy. It was a crazy amount of, never seen that many people. Everyone was like, it was, the last time I saw something like that was um, in 2009 when Twilight was big at Comic-Con in San Diego. And everyone was like, what the, where are all these girls showing up? What's, what's going on? They're taking over Comic-Con. And I'm like, ah, this is what it was like for the, the, the older guys at Comic-Con in 92, the, the Star Trek people, they fucking hated Image. <laughs> they were like, the fucking Image comics boom, Comic-Con. Like, I was, I was like, what are you talking about? You know? Um, I see they don't speak Klingon. And so, DC had to make a giant booth with all these graphics. And Marvel uh, kind of up their booth. Their their booth was this um, it was a square, and it was like a cross, an open cross, right? So you can kind of go through. And I was cutting through the Marvel booth to get to the DC booth to go to the Image booth. Like one of the, the images kind of split up ninety three, ninety four. Anyway, so I cut through the Marvel booth, and fucking I wasn't paying attention, and I ran into fucking Stanley. 
literally ran right into him. <laughs> like, 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 I was like, I looked down, like, hey, Stanley. And he was like, hello, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I, I swear to God, I was like, you know, the image booth's over that way. He was like, oh, I don't know about all that. Like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, thanks for the books. He was like, you're welcome, it's all here, you know. Like, I shook his hand real quick, and that was it. Like, that's that's it. But that was the it had to be the it was before Mallrats had come out. Um, and then when Mallrats came out, um. Stanley had that cameo on Mallrats, and all my friends were like, "Who is that guy? And is he dead?" Because the way like the way Kevin shot the Mallrats thing at the end, there's that thing where he goes, "Stan," and Stan looks back, "Yeah, would you would you change?" And he goes, "I would do it all again for just that one girl." It 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 felt like a eulogy, like like that's the last time we saw him, like that's it, goodbye, Stan. And all my friends were like, oh, what happened to him? I'm like, he's alive. He's at con. He just walks around. I, I walk right into him. <laughs> he apparently doesn't look where he's going. Uh, <laughs> he's a tall guy. And I was a tall kid. Uh, but uh, that was Jack Kirby died in 94, 95, 95. And so it was before Jack Kirby died. But that was, that was the only time I got to meet Stanley. Um, but, you know, like everyone else is an artist. I Man, I'm all about creator rights you know you always hear the stories if stanley gets credit the artists don't um i mean i can tell you why that like i can tell you why that is stanley was the only paid employee with the word marvel in it everyone else was a contract worker work for higher contract so what that means is anything stan did was owned by marvel because he was the employee and that's just the way the contracts worked and to this fucking day they do. So like um he got credit because he was a Marvel employee. If those artists were on Marvel payroll, they would have gotten credit. Um it's just it's sad. And it, and if if you read the deposition, you know it's available out on the internet folks. I don't have fucking links. But you can go read the Stanley, Marvel, Jack Kirby, whatever. Stan was trying to explain that, you know, very easily. Like, you know, I would give him an idea and then Jack would go and come back and here's a server and all this weird shit. And I'd have to go and like figure it out. And so there was really like a collaboration. But, you know, that just gets to the further the point that this country has just never gotten past that work for hire mentality in comics, um, let alone anywhere else. And the comics don't have a union or anything. So they're kind of fucked. Uh, that's what Image was about. Image was about stopping that. And a lot of people now think image was about drawing shoulder pads and muscles and <laughs> fucking small feet. No, it was about like, I can draw muscles and shoulder pads and small feet. And if it does well, I'll not only get the credit, I'll see the financial reward from that. That's it. That's all it was about. If something does well, then I reap the benefits, not this giant mega corporation. Um, right. And I mean, it kind of, for me, like it goes back to when I was a kid because when the first Superman movie came out, the creator of Superman, Joe Siegel, Jerry Schuster, Siegel and Schuster, they were living, they were sharing like an apartment in New York, like on assisted, like on social security, like assisted living, making nothing. And I think Neil Adams went to bat for them back in the day and got them a check for like a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, wow. It was nothing. That's crazy. Yeah. So like, um, and it started this whole thing about DC renegotiating creators' rights, and then Joe Jim Shooter did the whole thing at at Marvel with Epic, and that was going to be like well, you can release your own creator own books, and then you'll get a better percentage point. But if you go and watch the making of Image, it was always like that you never really owned it; you were just getting a slightly better take, slightly better mm-hmm. take, a slightly better take. Um, and I, I like now. It's and it's unfortunate because when you tell people now, hey man, these credit these artists should not only just get credit, they should get a fucking financial reward for this, regardless of the work for hire contract. There's always a group of people who go, well, they should have fucking known, you know, they should have known. <laughs> Meanwhile, if they fucking if these same people make one fucking thing, you know, that they see something like it, I knew the giant mega shark should have been a movie one day. That's my idea. You know, you never hear the end of Remember Brandon? Like, you ever have a friend who'll just be like, I knew the Cardinals should have done that play. Like, you know, you never they uh-huh. never hear the end of it. They think it's their fucking idea, you know? But, I mean, look what people do to each other when 
someone buys another friend a lotto ticket and they become a millionaire, you know? <laughs> like, like yeah, right. Right, Andy? Like, you buy me a lotto ticket, I win a billion dollars, and I'm like, fuck Andy. You know, like, I'm not giving him right. that. Fuck you, man. You know, I'm gone. A bit. You know, like, that That would be a really colossal dick move, right? So, um, this this industry hasn't fixed that yet. You know, there have been, image is still the best case scenario if you do well. The problem is doing well gets harder and harder. Even now that there's more comic books being printed than ever before, um, that means the growing amount of people buying those, like the, what, what is that? There's not, there's less books being, there's more books being sold, but less individual books being sold, right? So you just got a greater diversity of, of, of things to buy, but the people buying them are, are not growing that much. It's like the same people. They're just buying a lot of different things. Um, so guys that used to sell 100,000 books, say Spider-Man sold 100,000, now sells 30,000. And you're like, whoa, huh. Well, that's because they're oversaturating a lot of these titles anyway on their own. There's a lot of different reasons, of that, you know, and I've had yeah. endless conversations with writers and editors of these companies <laughs> in many different forms as an artist, as a merchandiser, um, uh, in publishing, every I've had every conversation for 10, 15 years. Everyone seems to have, you know, their theory as to why that is. At the end of the day, it is what it is, you know. And one of the things I can tell you is it's very difficult for people to go into an industry and be like, I can't wait to work 12 hours a day for 100 bucks. Yeah. You know, I mean, think about it. Like, if I'm drawing for 12 hours a day and I make $100 a page, I've drawn one page. For a hundred bucks a day for twelve hours of work. Hmm. hmm. Can I? Uh, can I loop back to a Stanley thing? Well, one second. Yeah. But but I just think like Stan was a guy who, despite those fucking things, always found a real positive way, you know, to talk about it. Mm-hmm. You know, like the one thing I can always say is I never once saw that guy rage on anybody. Right. No matter how many times I saw people rage at him through like panels at comic con or in interviews, you know, you always get one person who's like, what about that Jack Herbert? He's like, I was a friend of Jack. And look, there's a lot of people in that era who'd go, Stan was just an attention person. I I don't know, man. You know, in this era, it'd be like guys talking about like Robert Kirkman. Oh, Robert Kirkman. He was successful. He's, you know, he's got an opinion. I don't know. What I do know is I met a lot of comic book dudes who were fucking sour motherfuckers like <laughs> you know i'm a, i could be a little salty stan lee was never there's never a point where he he could have he would have been like fuck all you mother like <laughs> i'm stan lee bitches like he never had that about any well, artist very or, good at keeping that public face you know in a certain way certain light <clears throat> yeah he really really was um and under oath did everything he could to to give the credit where it was due. The problem is is we have a system that won't allow that, just won't allow that to, to get better. Um, right. But for me, the biggest thing was watching Stanley and Kevin Smith like merge together. You know, like those. It's hard to describe. I think to the modern day kid, like when I was a teenager, when the Kevin Smith films, they were a shared universe. Like those movies yeah. were connected, and that wasn't a normal thing. Two no, unrelated films had these characters that these stoners that were across between 3PO and Cheech and Chong, and they're running through these films, and each one has more vague references to the shit I love, and no one else is talking about this. From comic yeah. books, I mean, think about this: Chase and Amy featured indie comic book creators. That's my favorite one. And they're and they're bagging their own fucking oh, comics. Remember the scene where the girls are bagging their own comics and mailing shit yeah. out, like. I was watching that scene. I'm like, I wish I had that life. And now I'm like, I fucking hate shipping things. Like, <laughs> I know why they're drinking wine, you know, like, and complaining about life. I get it. <laughs> I thought I, I thought when I was growing up, I was like, I'm going to move somewhere with a loft. So I walk up my stairs and here's my cool art loft with these giant windows and I'll have my art desk just like them. <laughs> That's what I thought. I thought I was going to live in a cool ass loft. I was like, that's it. That's what an artist does. They live in this loft. You got the sunlight coming in. You kind of have a bedroom here and there. You got some cool shit. It's like, that's what I thought. I thought watching Chase and Amy, I was like, that's what a comic book artist's life is like. That's so cool. Yeah. It's, so, I know. 
It's like a figment of your fucking imagination, to quote a line from the same film. Yes. But, I mean, with Stanley was in that Mallrats movie, and then you get um, Chase and Amy, and then you get the, the, the Dogma, and you get the, the Jay and Silent Bob in the Clerks comic books from Oni mm-hmm. Press, and they were all connected. You know, and it, and it was like, that was the closest thing to, like, a, a modern version of Marvel that I had seen. As much as I like the image things, like what Kevin Smith was doing was like, wow, this is kind of like, this is pretty amazing. But I really felt that that him and Stan Lee together were like perfect. Like it, he remember he had him on that did a dinner for five. It was like Stan Lee and Mark Hamill and J.J. Abrams Play a round table <laughs> and Jason Lee. Yeah, it was dinner for five, and they were all talking about episode seven and comic books and shit. And it's just like Stan Lee, man, like always. I, you know, it's just I. It's just a shame that that uh, he he wasn't able to create more. Like I guess he had that ten he had like a ten year run where all the stuff at Marvel got made, and then mm-hmm. it was kind of like it. They did this thing like Stanley DC presents stuff, which was really fucking horrible, but um wasn't good. But uh, but I always felt like there was a point where the work Stan had created was kind of irrelevant, but then Stan became like the spokesperson for comics. And, and Kevin seemed to be like the next guy in line. That's why I fuck it. I was like, Kevin can't die when Kevin had his heart attack. And then Stan Lee died. Yeah. That sucks. So whatever. Um Brandon, you have another Stan Lee story? Uh, it wasn't so much a story. I was just gonna kinda go off of, of your story that and what I'm the point I made earlier that see I think that's cool. Your interaction was something that will be with you forever. So it was like an actual cool Moment. I know what he feels like in my face. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I smell, I smell them, smell like in heaven. Uh-huh. No, but it smells like pralines. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the closest I ever been to Stanley was probably like at one of the Marvel booths, and he was there up there signing stuff. And I just kind of stopped and looked at him. I was like, "Oh, there's Stanley." And then the scary guy's like, "Hey, move along." I was like, "All right, move along, move along." But that's a cool story. I mean, I know a lot of people who have paid, and this is fine. If this is what you wanted, that's cool. But they paid, you know, the $200 and you got to do that family portrait style thing where Stanley's sitting in the chair, arms crossed sitting there and you kind of just put your arm around him or you stand next to him, whatever comic book stuff you're wearing and they take the picture. And that's fine if you enjoyed that and that's great for you. But for me, that it would feel weird. It would feel very weird. But if I had a, a moment where I, like you, where you bumped into him or he was drinking coffee and I happen to be getting, I don't drink coffee, but let's say I, I walk in there and Stanley's like, hey, how's it going? And I'm wearing a Marvel shirt. You know, I'm like, oh shit, you know, I love your stuff. Blah, blah, blah. It was a natural moment. But Well, this is something it, else too, Brandon. Like, this is like, I didn't realize how special it was until later in life. Like, the experiences uh-huh. I had at Comic-Con every year when I was a kid, no one's having those again. Like, that was like before the giant, it was like right on the cusp of this giant you know, Spider-Man, mega fucking Marvel MCU universe thing. But like during the nineties, like I would walk up to Comic-Con and Stephen Hughes, you know, who Stephen Hughes is, he was the guy who uh, drew evil Ernie and, and lady. Oh, Death. Yeah, lady yeah. Death. Yeah. He used to just be outside on Comic-Con all the way in San Diego convention center. If you go all the way down, it's the last two doors um, before the, the Hilton or whatever that is, the, the, the hotel on whatever towards Seaport village. He'd be standing out there ever just, always with like a book or a coffee hanging out there. And I would just go there every year and talk to him for like an hour and then go in, you know, like that was just something I did every year until unfortunately he passed away. And I was like, Oh, I'm never going to get to see Steven again. So, and he was, he would always just look at the art and talk about art and, and just, you know, like it was just always cool, man. Kevin Smith was a guy I met for the first time around 95, 96, maybe 96 con. I can't remember, but, um, it it was I think it was his first San Diego Con because he didn't have I had seen Mallrats and he had merch but I was like I want the blueprints you gotta make the blueprints <laughs> from the movie the Wiley e. Coyote blueprints and then yeah. next year he's like I got the blueprints and I was like oh shit soul motherfucker so <laughs> but that was a guy who I never once seen him get fucking angry one time uh, it was the last it was two the 2001 Con it was right when I had come back from the army so I'm standing there. And they had moved Artist Alley to the left side of the convention center. And I was over there looking to see who'd be down there. And Jim Lee was drawing. And Jim Lee hadn't drawn a book in a while. And kids were trying to get him to draw anime. And they were, like, not having his <laughs> art. You know, they're like, I don't know. The eyes, it doesn't look right. And I was like, 
this is a guy who used to walk on a comic con and everyone was like surrounding him you know like like Superman. Remember they all reach out to touch Superman in BBS? Like it was like that. Yeah. I actually saw that happen to Jim Lee once in ninety seven. I saw <laughs> I'll never forget. Where I mean this swarm of people reaching out to touch Jim Lee. It was amazing. Um and then two thousand one no one gave a shit. So I'm sitting there watching that. And this is before he sold Wildstorm, right before he sold Wildstorm to D C and everything. So I'm looking at that going, God damn, you know, those fucking kids. And then I look <laughs> over to my left and Kevin Smith is just leaning against one of the pillars at Convention Center. They have those pillars, stone pillars. And he's just, he's got his, like, hand in a comic book. And then, as if he knew, he looks up and looks at me. And he's, like, his eyes open, like, don't. You know, because you could just for a second, I was like, you know, do you, do you yell at Kevin? You know, Kevin Smith? And he's, like, giving me the please don't. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, and right, I just looked at him and quietly, gave, like, un, you know, just gave him the, like, the thumbs up, like, man, it's all good. And he's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> 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 and that's the closest I ever seen to him get, like, you know, please don't, like, right. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah. See, I, uh, the, I don't, I mean, I don't know how many people know this artist, but there's a a painter who did a bunch of covers for Marvel a couple of years ago, uh, Marco. And I'm, I can't say his last name very well. De George of You never got it. Go ahead. I'm never going to pronounce <laughs> it. Yeah. He's, a, he's a German painter. Uh, he did a whole bunch of like the Daredevil covers when they were all painted and had that real cool uh, old school look. But anyways, at one of the Marvel, or not Marvel, I'm sorry, uh, Wizard Worlds that I actually, you know, I met you at later on. But uh, it was either one of the Dallas ones or one of those where it was like in Chinatown or whatever. I was, uh, there was this art auction going on and there's a bunch of famous artists drawing like, uh, I don't know, I couldn't remember any others besides him. And then I happened to go outside on the balcony and I was just having a drink and he came down, he came out there and sat right next to me at the, at the same table as I was like, hey, can I sit here? And I got to actually chat with him. You know, his English was a little broken, but, you know, we got to sit there and have a, a beer together. And, you know, he's just telling me about his painting and just talking to me. And I thought that was super cool. And that's like a moment that's going to, you know, stay with me that when I look back and I see this guy's art, I'm like, hey, you know, I actually got to sit down with this guy and have a beer. You know, he's not that he may not be as known as like a Jim Lee, but a lot of people know his painted covers and posters that he did and such. But and then he drew right moment. over your Wolverine head. No, no, no. I yeah. And I also have my bad moments of meeting artists now <laughs> who are on your who girlfriend they're rock stars. Yeah. Yes. And <laughs> hit on my fiance at the time. And yeah. Uh, you know, also who writers who have signed over my Jim Lee art, you know, yeah. so it's awesome. There's been bad moments. These all, you know, and they'll, these artists aren't, these artists aren't Stanley. Stanley was a movie star. I mean, he was the movie star of the comic world. Like you say, Stanley, everybody knows who the you're talking about. You know, some people to an extent know Jim Lee, but other than that, we all fall under the same broad character uh, category of who are you? You did what? Oh, that's cool. Unless you're the, you know, you're Captain America in the movies or you're Stan Lee. Nobody knows who you are in the comic book world. But, you know, Stan Lee transcended that. You know, you see him in like a mall rats and you're like, that's Stan Lee. You know it's Stan Lee. It's like yeah, I would person. recommend Kevin and Mark Bernard did a good eulogy on Stan and Kevin's all of his experience with Stan. And like that, that's a really good conversation about that. Um, really, I, if there's one thing I would, I would stop listening to this, go watch that. that that's pretty good. Uh, I do have one last Stan Lee thing. So, like, in 2005, 2006, uh, I was working on this book called Mosaic with my buddy Adam Kogan, and he's a game developer. And uh, we were going to... He'd, he'd come in flying to San Diego, and then we'd go down there, and basically we were pitching the books to all the indie publishers at the time. There was this little wave of indie publishers at, at the time, like Ape Entertainment, Arcana, Viper Comics, a bunch of them. On top of image, and uh, finally I show it to to we go in 2005. Got some okay feedback. Worked on it for another year. Came back, pitched the book to Eric Larson. He loved it. Put me in front of Jim, uh, uh, fucking Jim Valentino, and Valentino gave us a deal on the book. And I was like, this is awesome. We're finally gonna get our own book. And through Image, I'm so amazed. Uh, hmm. And then Stan Lee came out with this. Uh, animated movie called mosaic <laughs> and they're like you need to change the name and i'm like it's fucking the point of the it was about this book where this dimension was bringing in different 
pieces of other dimensions into it, like a mosaic. So it was like, it's kind of, what? You know? And then I was like, fucking Stanley. Like, <laughs> you, you know? And then, you, and then the fucking mosaic animated movie comes out, and it's horrible. It's this really shitty, like, cr- like clearly they, they just put Stan's name on it and made something, you know? And so it was like, he didn't even care. It's not like it was like his next thing. It was like, he's just making money. And so it kind of bummed out my writer and then he didn't finish the scripts and the book never got published. So it's my Stanley kept, <laughs> damn you, Stanley, you know, but, uh, whatever. Look, at the end of the day, folks, if you come up with an idea and someone else has the same title as you, just, just put, put the real in front of it. I learned that from Ghostbusters. So like when the Ghostbusters movie came out, <laughs> yeah. right. Filmation made this really shitty, like Ghostbusters cartoon that had nothing to do with the movie. And they put it out, and it's called Ghostbusters. And you were looking at it like, where's Vankman? Why is there a giant monkey? Like, what the fuck is this thing? And so the Ghostbusters cartoon came out. They put the real Ghostbusters. So I have learned that. Like, anytime you, you know, like Andy's like, I'm going to make the Andy Bond game, and I fucking put one out, you know? (laughs) You could just put the real Andy (laughs) Bond, bitch, you know? (laughs) I'm like, ah, yeah, thought me. So that's that. Um, let's do one more topic. Brandon, do you want to talk? Guys, we'll take a vote. Do you want to talk about Daredevil season three or the Aquaman trailer? Uh, I'd rather go for Daredevil. All right. We'll talk. about. I would, I would talk too much shit about Aquaman. All right. We'll talk about Daredevil season three in one second. Then we'll wrap it up. Daredevil season three. Daredevil season three. All right. Who wants to start with this? Andy, you want to? I haven't finished it, by the way. I haven't finished it. Ah, come on. Are you serious? Yeah, I have two episodes to go. I didn't know we were going to talk about it, so don't spoil anything. I have two episodes to go. Talk <laughs> it's in the document. Yeah, Brandon doesn't read doesn't the document like... until the day of. Andy, I didn't so get to know. finish it. I tried. <laughs> right, it's like we eight years ago in this podcast. We have still... two episodes left. We have two episodes left, okay? We're on episode 11 of 12. Spoilers, they all die, just like the Pokemon. You shut your damn <laughs> crap mouth. All right. <laughs> I got a real spoiler for you though, Brandon. I will punch canceled. you. I will punch you. I will punch you right in the <laughs> D. Right in the D. All right, I'll try not to spoil. I, I mean, I understand what. Uh, or I think I remember everything Just that don't happened. Don't talk about the, the last two episodes. About all right. I mean, so where where do we want to start? Like what we what think you, of what it you so like, far? What you like about it? The yeah, we don't. It don't much. look. Here's the thing. We don't. I don't. We don't need to. This is the one thing I don't like about Kevin Smith will do a review and he'll just basically do like the audio. He'll just tell you the whole movie from start to scratch. I'm like, don't do that. <laughs> just tell me what you love, didn't love what you thought. It's like your general reaction to it. You know? um, what I loved about it is that it showed Matt Murdock um, struggling. I mean, I was very excited about this. Uh, Mary was talking about it when she saw the trailer. She's like, oh, okay, it seems to be about the basic, like, you know, bad guy gets out, fights the good guy, you know, whatever. And then there's always these twists in the middle. But mine was like, I understand that those are going to be the tropes that they have to go through. But Matt Murdock is struggling with everything that happened, you know, at the end of Defenders. And he's struggling with himself and what he what he needs to be and what he has to be or what he wants to be. You know what I mean? Like the tail, the uh, scales were tipped over, you know, Matt Murdock and Daredevil. And I was very excited about that, about that internal struggle. Uh, what I didn't like about it is that there, they seem to be less on Matt Murdock and more on the FBI agent and everything else going around. Nadine? Yeah. I was like, I mean, he seems like a cool character, I guess, but I don't care, you know? And then we did that whole... Alexander you know, was, Knox. Remember, yeah, remember the Batman like, movie? They throw in the new... Alexander yeah, Knox. Or the whole Karen Page episode. Oh, hey yeah. man, look, exactly. you can say, look, here you can say, I know a lot of people complain about that Karen Page episode. My wife loved it. She looked at it, I know this. I'm like, oh no, what dark secrets do you hold? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know. I don't, she's like, you know this song? I don't know the song. I was in my I was in the army and I was drawing in my room. I don't fucking know this music, you know? <laughs> and that looks like everyone's ruining their lives. Like, that's great. So I don't, I mean, look, I think at the end of the day that, Daredevil season one, two, and three. If they never make anything else, it might be the perfect blend between the serious of a dark night and the comic book world of like, you know, the crow and the first turtles movie, you know, where you get 
sort of a heightened reality, you know, where some unbelievable shit can happen, but they still try to like root it in some level of, of, uh, tangibility. I'm not gonna say believability because, you know, the man can, is blind and can fucking leap off rooftops and shit. Like, you know, it's not believable, but it's, it's physical. It's there. Spoiler alert. Um, and I would easily, I mean, like, like if this is all we ever got, this, I mean, this absolutely would have, it might be my favorite comic book thing ever just in terms of the amount of time it takes on things i just like, you're either for that or you're not i know some people like it takes too long and i'm like then they go and watch a fucking spider-man movie like i wish there was more time and so, i don't know about those people man. you know like there's a giant contrarianism right now in, in the comics fan community where you know they love to hate shit that you hate and they hate shit that you love for me this really like this is all like when I say almost perfect, the only thing that I could say is, well, that 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 makes it from being like the greatest fucking thing ever, is that uh, they they do create a bunch of characters you don't know what you're like you don't what's the point in eighteen like I don't really like it you know Foggy's girlfriend she's fun but what's the point of that you know like this is little right. things like that where you're like. They don't have it all figured out, and that's fine. We all don't have it all figured out before we start. That being said, this is pretty fucking amazing. I wish this series could dovetail into a Turtles film series on Netflix. Like, the same fucking universe. <laughs> you know, we could just... The Turtles and Daredevil are so tied together. You know, I mean, that, it's possible. They're rebooting everything from the 90s, it seems, so... Uh, I wish you could job. just... wish you could just... I mean, and, and Vincent D'Onofrio's Kingpin is, I mean... This is so fucking amazing. He's a he's a total monster. I mean, I, in season two, talk about season two of Daredevil. There, so you get done watching that hallway fight, you know, which, which is, is the greatest one of the greatest yeah. fights I've ever seen. You get done seeing that giant monologue between him and the Punisher, you know, and some brutal violence, and you think, okay, I got a grip on this, and then Matt goes and picks a fight with Kingpin in jail, and <laughs> Kingpin just he does something that you just hadn't seen in the series. He's just savage force he's, so savage. he's just pure he's a force that that matt doesn't even realize until that moment it's like it's like um you're i hate to I'm not, i don't want to make light of natural disasters but there's always someone who thinks they're captain dan from forrest gump they're gonna rage at the storm and win mm-hmm. you know like ah storm and then you know they're trapped and firefighters go gotta get them and some or or in the hurricanes they, they gotta get rescued and they're like i thought i didn't matter. I th- I almost feel like everyone warns Matt to not go and fucking piss off Kingpin, and then he does. And the way he gets just like table slammed, just manhandled <laughs> in Daredevil season two, it felt like when I was a kid, I got the shit. Kick- you ever pick a fight with like a high schooler when you're in grade school? Like, <laughs> you ever talk a little too much shit sometimes, and you get your ass handed to you? So there's there's that, and Anytime, like the one of the things I love about Daredevil season three is just watch, watch the hand movements that Kingpin makes. He's like always oh, like, yeah. like you he's know, crunch, he's crunching his hand like a fist and not a fist, where it's like he's squeezing an invisible stress ball, yeah, or something. And you're just like, <laughs> fuck, what's he gonna do? Is he gonna? And like, you know, there's a scene. I don't think it's episode, I don't know, ten or something, where he tells the guy to give him his jacket, and I'm like. Oh, he's. I, I just looked at Jessica, my wife, and I'm like, "Oh, he's fucked." She goes, "What?" And I'm like, "I just get quiet." And he puts the jacket over him and just starts beating the shit out of him. And he's like, "All right, pull over, get rid of the body." Like, like God, he's such a good villain because he's so he's smart, he's brutal, he's everything you want in a villain, and he 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 makes the show amazing. He's a great opposite to the character of Daredevil, who's a finesse fighter and. You know, also a smart character, but it's just it's like a chess match between those two. And, and I don't even say scary. like Matt. By the third season, he's not a finesse fighter. I mean, he's putting Muay Thai ropes on his fists. Oh, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And just literally just raiding his way aggressively. <laughs> like it's he kind of turns into like the Mick Foley of superheroes. By the third season, he's just <laughs> getting. <laughs> you know, he's getting just. <laughs> yeah, you're like, why, Matt? Why are you doing this to yourself? Um. Also, with with what you were saying, with what was I going with that? I had a fucking something. God damn it, Brandon. Um, brute force, brute force, 
pick a fight with him. Pick a fight. Oh, no. no. Uh, damn it. I lost, I I lost. Oh, De Niro. So you remember The Untouchables? The movie The Untouchables with Kevin Costner and Sean Connery? Yeah. yeah. So back in the day, there was a movie called The Untouchables, directed by Brian De Palma. And De Niro played Al Capone. And there's this famous scene where Al's talking to all the guys at a dinner, and he's got a baseball bat, and he just takes a baseball bat on a guy from behind, right at the dinner table. And it's just like this stunning shocker moment. And when that came out, when I was a kid, everyone was like, you know, it was, it was just like disturbing and violent, and you didn't see it coming. It was kind of a funny scene that just turned horribly wrong. And I keep thinking, like, this kingpin... Like you couldn't, like, like that's he would do that with his fists. He wouldn't need the baseball. <laughs> he would just, you know, like the kingpin in this show would scare the fuck out of De Niro's Capone. You know, with not even so. I just the I just I just don't think we we're gonna get a villain like that in any movie anytime soon. You know, with. Yeah. Just in terms of the time they've been able to spend with the Kingpin character. And, and I think it was funny. Someone was mentioning, I can't remember, who did I hear? I can't remember. Someone on Twitter probably was saying that it's funny how Thanos is probably the best overall villain on the MCU, him and Loki, but Thanos ultimately um, wins out because that movie's so strong. But that the arcs, and then on the TV side, it's, you know, the Kingpin. But it seems that they flip their arcs. You know, like Thanos and the death story from is not in the movies right it's just the survival of the fittest and i got a plan to to even out you know to control the population and the crime in the universe which was kind of kingpin's motivations in the comics right keep control of everything uh you know murder half the fucking criminals because i you know we can control them and then they flipped them they gave kingpin the the love angle and thanos the kingpin angle it's kind of kind of interesting uh, I don't obviously not intentional, but um, but I mean, it's just a fantastic show. I I hope they get a season four. You know, I'd like to, I'd like for it to be a season four, and I know that they're in discussion for a season four. But with all these comic companies trying to do their own streaming service, well, that's a whole not, other problem. You know, you like know, you know. <clears throat> There it's should just be saturation issue for that, but that's a whole different topic. Yeah, well, there should just be why there's a DC service that isn't connected to Warner Brothers. I'll never know. You know. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, I hope that they do a season four. Um, I mean, people have had their problems with the other shows, but I wanted another season of Luke Cage at least. But yeah, I'd like um, to see Electric come back and. The, the bullseye storyline. You keep aversion. bringing that back, though, and it becomes like, okay, here we, you know, we're just recycling. Depends on how they do it, or they could work that storyline in with Echo, which would be an interesting character to bring. In, yeah, given the king. But as far as Electric goes, you know, she did. She came back. She came. She was in Defenders, so like they had that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Spoiler. Possible. Possible. <laughs> Possible. But. I mean, I, I or, it, like I said. Or they could bring in Sleepwalker, right, Brandon? Sleepwalker. So, <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah, probably not. Uh, I wish they'd just bring in the Turtles, but separate universe. Don't get my say. Anything else? Have we missed anything on that, Brandon? Brandon, you should go finish the show. It'll only take like nine more years. Got two episodes left, and we were going to finish it tonight, but... Uh... Oh, it's I'm the one who's held you up from finishing. That, the is, that is it. It's that me. Yeah, it's, it's me, the, the thumbnail. Yeah, Andy, it's your fault too. He, uh, my, well, well, I'll t- I'll shoulder that. Most things are Andy's fault, and I blame Andy one hundred percent. Okay, right. just rolls right off the back. I don't even care. Uh, Andy, any specific things you want to call out? Any picks, things to look for, recommendations? Um, Nothing. Not really. Nothing no, shout out. Not right. Where can people find your work online? Where can they, where can they find Andy and complain? Mm-hmm. Oh uh, <laughs> man! I mean, right now you can find me on a lot of different sketch card sets. You know, uh, Star Wars and Walking Dead and my DC Bombshell. So pick up a box of those. Pick up a couple of packs. Rick and Morty. You know, I'm I'm in there. I've kind of unfortunately put the comics off to the side for a lot of sketch card work. But no, 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 no. Drawing. Yeah, so I'm definitely keeping busy. So you can find me online. 
uh, Facebook. You know, the name is Bon, Andy Bon. That's B O H N. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Elvatron, E L V A T R O N. Uh, you can pretty much search Elvatron, you'll find me on every sort of media form. And you can find the real AndyBond.com where I put up <laughs> I'm actually going to take that. Lewd, po- <laughs> lewd poses of Andy wearing nothing but Pikachu mink. You know, like <laughs> uh, you know, I change it up. I go, you know, just the the princess peach crown only. You know, Bowserette, Bowsette. Yeah, right, that's the <laughs> Andy. And you nice call me Andette. I know it's all. <laughs> and Brandon, where can people? Uh, can people find the mega potato mega potato.com you can find me at i hate oh, andy no. bond oh bond. no why would brandon do that <laughs> you can find me on brandon Instagram. lost all of his friends.com <laughs> brandon, <laughs> brandon doesn't make art anymore.com oh uh, yeah you can, find, you can find me and my let me say it on instagram at mega potato show and you could also find me on twitch at Mega Potato Show. Cross promotion, baby. I want to find you on that Twitch. When's the next time you're going to be twitching? Good job, Brandon. So you, you can find me on those. <laughs> Good job, Brandon. We're really looking forward to that show. Well, I got a text message, Ninja and Drake, and see when we're all going to meet up to play, you know. Us big Twitch streamers got to stick together. So, are you gonna are you gonna up. stream Pokemon Go or Let's Go uh, Pikachu? I can't because it's on the Switch and you have to buy that whole I think converter thing. It's like a pain in the butt. I heard. Um, it's good, but to hear. I will stream Black Ops Four, and that is all right now on my Xbox One because I don't have any other games and I can't afford them. So. Yeah, realbroketaters.com is where you go. Yeah. <laughs> <Find it. laughs> slim, pick, slim Pickens Taters. Brandon. That's where you can find me. Brandon's like, can I get your download code for Spyro? Can I get your download code for Spyro? So, <laughs> uh, all right. you, got, you, got any, you guys got any more of them free downloads? <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. You can find me here next week. Swear to Jeebus. Uh, color penciling all week long. Wrapping up this commission, and as we go into the Darksiders piece, just in time to miss Darksiders 3, those people over at the Darksiders thing, they get annoyed with me. Like, we really wanted to promote your work, but you didn't finish it. I'm like, I don't fucking care. So, uh, <laughs> I didn't, can't leave me alone. You know what I mean? Like, pay, pay, pay a mother. So, um, yeah, whatever. you <laughs> I don't do this for you. So you can see me doing that, and we'll be back in a couple weeks with some more Mega Show. Brandon, say goodbye to the Mega Show, everybody. We're going to go. Mega Mega Show, show. please subscribe and get that notification going. Ding, ding, ding. everybody look at that you made it to the end of the show the very end this is where it all ends brandon the edge of the universe (laughs) the edge of the podcast out of 100 views maybe maybe three of you made it (laughs) i'm gonna i'm gonna for the over under i'm gonna say five five i'm gonna say five people made it to the end and four of those are are hector and his family so, right. I was going to say Hector <laughs> and maybe uh, Crusher. Mm. Maybe Kyle. Kyle likes to. Sometimes. Kyle, you don't have anything to do. <laughs> <laughs> the podcast is talking to me. <laughs> That's what it's like to be in Kyle's head right now, everybody. So you made it to the end of the show. Um, and you may have noticed, gee, this podcast is a little different than, than the last uh, six so seven we've done? <laughs> I don't know. We didn't get too far before. I was like, ah, it sucks. So uh, <laughs> uh, we've been doing this thing now together, unfortunately, for 
How many years, Brandon? <laughs> years? I want to. I want to say five. Did I brought you on what? Two thousand thirteen or twelve? Twelve. I think it was twelve. I think I became twelve. I you brought me on for a couple, and then after that, regular chatting. Yeah, it they, turns they out evolved from that. It turns out most of my audience doesn't like hearing me talk <laughs> for extended periods of time. Somehow. I'm told it sounds as if I'm telling them what to do. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And with you, it just, everything sounds so absurd. I, I, I don't know why, but people like my voice. I mean, I hear it all the time. People feel, I like your voice. I like the way I'm like, I guess. All right. Thanks. But, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Can't change it. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> the sounds of taters. I'm told people like the sound of my voice when I'm making fun of you. So that's the show now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you all created this. That's what you made. Uh, but something something else. Um, I, I don't like doing these <laughs> every week. So I like doing the podcast. I like talking about stuff. It's fun to do. It's not really, you know, we all know this is... You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't come to Sketchcraft to listen to the fucking two-hour-long podcast. But some of you have nothing else to do in the middle of the night. You, you need something on while you're drawing, and I think a longer format show suits that better. That's the whole reason for this, Brandon. Right? We are, we are certified background noise for everybody. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, absolutely. When it comes to me telling you what to do, I know I'm background noise. Because you don't hear, fuzzy, a, fuzzy you don't hear a fudging noise. thing. Something else I know. So I, I got done. I just got done uh, editing the show together because uh, a little bit of little bit of cuts and trims and snips here and there. Um, few few notes, Brandon. You, sh- you should write this down, right? Get out your uh, your uh, your napkin and your and your, your, your pen, your big pen or whatever, your sharpie, and write this down. Rob needs to not curse. So you, you can find that as the later the night gets in the podcast, the F word just every other word. <laughs> it's just, yes. I was just like dropping. Hmm, I'm not even a sailor. I was a soldier. Potty, potty mouth craft. I, I don't mind every now and then, but even I'm like, man, I must have been really tired. I do blame a little bit on the, uh, I, I'm still kind of, eating some of those Thanksgiving leftovers, so I'm, I'm a little drowsy. <laughs> I'm a little not in the right mood. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I feel you. I was, uh, when I texted you before this, I was laying on the floor on my ru- my new rug that we got for the front room, and I'm just laying there like, I texted you, I was like, hey, are we, are we doing this? And I was like, a part of me was like, I hope he doesn't reply. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you all eat like this all year. So uh, I, uh, I this is literally the big meal I save, and I, and I make it myself. So I make the turkey, uh, I do this soy honey glazed turkey in the crock pot, and then I finish it off in the oven for about thirty minutes. I make the stuff and everything from scratch, right? So that's got a uh, you know, three types of artisan breads that kind of mix together and dry out the night before. I got a uh, pecans in there, Italian sausage, celery, apple. Uh, two kinds of apple, a red and green. Chef, chef crab. Yeah, I got the cranberry things in there, and it's super, it's super good. Um, make the yams from scratch. The yams are the easiest, man. You just cut up about two to three pounds of yams, and you put in about, oh, I don't know, a couple sticks of butter, and you put in your your pumpkin spice mix, which I make from scratch. This is just nutmeg, cinnamon, allspice, ground ginger. Uh, you put all that in there. Um, and you uh, you let that boil in those juices and then that, that butter that butter pumpkin spice mix for about 20 to 30 minutes or so and it it cooks the yams in the butter <laughs> so, so if you, you've hung around this long on the podcast you are now listening to cooking tips with yeah, rob and this, mega potato this is other than brandon this is my only hobby like <laughs> <laughs> my wife was asking me about that. She was like, you know, you don't have to do all the cooking. I'm like, I absolutely have to. And she's like, well, why? I'm like, well, one, she can't cook. Really, she can't. Uh, two, I've always had it in me since I was a kid. I mean, we're going way back. Like, you know, the, the second or third grade, I, I begged my teachers to teach us how to cook. Because my father, was, he bought a microwave oven. And he was like, 
You only have to microwave food from now on. And he meant that. He was really serious. I ate nothing but TV dinners for two years before I fucking wanted to kill myself. And I'm, and I honestly, I, I, I was, I'm not even like joking about that. Like I really did not want to live on earth until like I learned how to cook. Uh, it was tough, man. Around the fourth or fifth grade, I finally got one of those teachers to start teaching culinary classes. Um, but I told my wife, I'm like, you know, we have to eat. So if I have a hobby, this is the one. Unlike music or <laughs> sports, or like, I really, at, we have to eat. So I may as well eat good. Uh, but I, I do, I see Brandon, I prefer to limit the carbs and, and the food throughout the year. And then come Christmas time, have fun. You know, I, I don't like this whole getting to Christmas time, Thanksgiving time. And like, we got to limit our food. You know, so I, I, mm-hmm. I don't like that for me. That's not the life I want to live. So restraint throughout the year. And then right now I got fat hands. So <laughs> I feel like I I've, oh God, Brandon, it's tough. Uh, anyhow, so you got to like, got to help me with the language moving on. I'm putting that on you. Okay. So if I curse, it's your fault. Right? Right. So. Can I get, can I get a penny for every time you say the curse? You can't. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, I don't get a penny for every time we make a show. You know, you know how YouTube works. <laughs> you know how YouTube works for Sketchcraft. <laughs> so it's open. You know what's funny is once YouTube started paying me like two hundred bucks a year, I canceled. Uh, we were storing the podcast on Podbean or Pod- Podomatic, and they man, I was like. It wanted like five bucks or ten bucks a month. However, it was it came out to what YouTube was paying me, so I figured it was a net even. And then for a small little bit, we got a little bit more YouTube money. I went from two hundred to like two fifty, two sixty. It was really like a fifty or sixty dollar increase. And I was like, you know what? I'm no longer paying for this podcast. So I I deleted all the shows in the podcast to the free amount, which was like five episodes. We could store on average. And uh, I'm like, I'm keeping that 250 bucks, you know, uh, which I put right back into stupid art supplies. But but now we're at a point where uh, YouTube's paying me like maybe 100 bucks a year. So I was like, damn it. So I just went back to paying for this new service. Uh, what is it called? I, I can't remember the service I'm using now. That's funny, right? Uh, Pinecast. That's what we're using. We're using Pinecast now. But for five bucks a month, they don't charge me for storage or bandwidth. So we can put up the longer shows now. We can do longer shows. And that's why I've been thinking about this whole, like, moving back to a longer show format. So, one, I don't have to talk so friggin' fast. I mean, if you go back to those, you go back to those early shows, Brandon, you know. It was like, welcome mm-hmm. to Sketchcraft. I don't know, micro, we don't know micro machines. We're going to get the big ones and the fat ones. <laughs> you're going to get your art. You're going to yes. get sketches. You're going to get pens. You're going to get pencils. You know, like. <laughs> People were like, is it the coffee? I'm like, no, man. Coffee chills me out. I actually, I think it's the fact that we I can only do shows that are 20 or 30 minutes long because they, they're they going to charge me for bandwidth overages. A couple times I had to pay for bandwidth overages. So on a couple of those older episodes... We got 60,000 downloads or 108, one of them got like 180,000 downloads, which is pretty big cool. for Sketchcraft, right? Yeah. yeah. And then I owed money for that. <laughs> like I was like, wait, so if I make a show people listen to, I'm going to owe more money? Well, what's the fucking incentive for that? So that's when I brought you on. And those numbers went right on back down, like <laughs> to Sketchcraft levels. Uh, so we did that. And then because of thinking about the longer show i'm like you know brandon we need some theme songs <laughs> mm-hmm. and you may have noticed there's a little bit of a ha huh. if you call this a theme song what i went and did folks is i went and found four four songs four different kinds of like 80s kind of upbeat stuff three three kind of like upbeat 80s kind of synth songs and one is like this dark blade runner-esque like thing and uh I got Brandon up around, I don't know, what, what time? 2 a.m.? <laughs> something, something like that. Yeah, somewhere I, just, about right. I wake you up out of a sleep, and we kind of talked over these songs. We did about, I don't know, 8 or 12 takes, like maybe huh? more. And then I went, I went back to bed. You said we were done, and then you said, hey, hey, 
I I recorded something wrong or you did something wrong. We had to we had to go back and do some more. Oh, we still got to do more because like I'm listening to them and they're funny, but I kind of want to space out some of the front end and you know really make the stupid stuff sound a little bit more intentional. Like, I'm not gonna say good. We'll say <laughs> <laughs> you know it's, what is what is good, um, but intentional. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyhow, so we'll be rotating through these these openers as we go along, and then you know give you a little feedback, folks. What do you think? Uh, some of it you're not gonna understand. It's just gonna be kind of weird. But that's that's how I like to do things around here. Weird. What else? Uh, what? What? You anything to say about the theme songs, Brandon? Anything you want to add? They are kooky, fun, and definitely mm-hmm. entertaining. Mm-hmm. I don't remember half the stuff I said because I was half awake. And at one point, the next morning, I was like, did I stay up last night making intro songs? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, I was, you're like, yeah, we did that. And I was like, oh, good Lord. Yeah, my, my wife <laughs> my wife likens it to when I get up in the middle of the night and I, I grab her toothbrushes to do splatters or some of her, her <laughs> I make I make use of her beauty supplies and I need tools I don't have for some commission. And <laughs> she just has to, re- she's like, he just raids my entire you know, there's, it's kind of like that thing in the toy store where there's always something in the back. You know, when you can't find it, it must be in the back. When I can't find the right tool at 2 a.m., there must be something I can MacGyver my way through in the bathroom or the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you got a little bit of that, that 3 a.m. 3 a.m. love from Sketch. Hmm. Uh, fucking songs cost me $70, so I'm going to be getting a lot of use out of that. <laughs> like, <laughs> but every now and then I, pu- I put just a little bit of money into the show, folks. Just a little bit, you know. Uh, certainly I'm not giving that money to Brandon, so it's got to go into mm-hmm. something. Yeah. That's correct. So what else? What else with this episode I could think of kind of recapping? Oh, yeah. So uh, I really had intended to talk about Stanley, and then uh, Spyro came out, and Andy had been texting me for a week his progress like the man literally platinum <laughs> that game like I mean, when he say pl- like that's a lot of dragons like he went oh through- he just texted me today he has double platinum did <laughs> yeah yeah uh, uh, yes yeah. he uh he texted me today at uh i'd have to look back at my messages but i think it was around six o'clock yeah uh, i oh, think he's put seven. more time into playing that game than everyone did making it you know, I yeah. think I think he, it's possible. <laughs> at seven thirty seven I got a text from Andy Bond, the real Andy Bond, just got the platinum trophy for Spyro two. So so I thought, hey, why don't I have Andy on to kind of talk about the game? Little little thing though is I wasn't certain if we were gonna have Andy on the whole show because I the idea is that I thought it'd be fun to bring so I gotta finish the sentence. Okay. <laughs> See, this is the problem, right? When I'm at, I, I don't make show notes, I can't just follow the list. So when it's in my head, you start, you stop, you start, you stop. So when we normally have guests on, they kind of have a time limit of thirty minutes to an hour, right, mm-hmm. Brandon? Right before yeah. they have to they have to go to their life. And Andy has a girlfriend, and they got kids over there and everything. And he has a job. So I figured, well, we'll just start talking about Spyro, and I can rearrange the order of the show. You know. <laughs> So keep him around for about 30, 40 minutes, and then, all right, and then goodbye, Andy, and then Brandon and I will just talk about Stan Lee, which was going to be, like, the focus of the show. Mm-hmm. But Andy didn't seem to have any problem hanging around, so I figured we'd go right into Stan Lee. I didn't know Andy didn't like Stan Lee. <laughs> I never bothered, never bothered to ask him about that. And You know, he's taking the side of artists, and hell, I'm an artist, so I should, too. Uh, but I do know I can't blame. I'm not going to blame blame creative talent for decisions owners make for businesses, folks. Stanley was a creative guy, right? He wrote, he did art direction at Marvel for the longest time, uh, editor of all those books. There are people who owned that company. They're the ones that made the decisions to not credit artists and not pay out royalties and everything else. You know, uh, at DC, Marvel, wherever else, EC, all that stuff. And and to blame mm-hmm. any 
creative person for the decisions of of uh, bean counters and CEOs. It's just it's just not how we do things around here. But I didn't want to also. I don't want to be combative with it. You know, I don't want to put. I mean, Andy's a friend of the show. I don't want to be like Andy. What you know? And then this turns into like the <laughs> betrayal of Andy Bond, I need, right? <laughs> I had to re-listen to it because I didn't. I didn't realize he wasn't very. Yeah, because I stopped him really quick. You know, like I, I, I maneuvered around that fairly well. And he's not, you know, I think after I kind of got into like how positive Stan was throughout the years, you could definitely tell Andy was like, yeah, that's true. You know, like, so um, it's not him. It's just that there is this part where people want artists to be credited. And man, that's that's the whole point of Image. That was, that was I, I got into that around the show. So uh, that being said, I had thought the Stan Lee thing would be up in the front. I didn't think we were going to take like an hour <laughs> to get to talking about Stan Lee, you know? Uh, so a little bit of a, I gotta, I gotta structure out the show a little bit better, but it was fun to hear you two, you two uh, get, get real sweaty about Pokemon. So, you know, <laughs> and wait till you see my facial reactions to you do just rambling. So, Brandon knows he, they can't see the camera when, when I'm recording here, unless I'm streaming. Uh, but Brandon, you should know if I don't talk for 20 minutes, people are getting a shell one way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I have no problems. Some people think that I, I talk because I'm not letting you talk or I'm trying to ramble over the show. What they don't understand is Brandon will just, will have not much to say. Like you'll just, you don't have a lot to say, right, Brandon? See, that's what I'm talking about. See, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's that's the jokes Brandon makes. He writes that yeah. stuff. I do. It's in but, my little joke book. But when you do get onto something like a Pokemon, I just sit back and <laughs> I like how you talked about the game, but didn't mention any real game mechanics, uh, the flow <laughs> of the game, what it's like to turn on, whether you had to update. N- nothing really concrete. Just something just... about Pidgeys and. <laughs> <laughs> and fur <laughs> a lot of go ahead Brandon <laughs> explain yeah. yourself because you know nobody gives a shit about it. like I'm like, oh like, no hey, oh you Brandon know, you I... cursed you cursed you did it first <laughs> yeah I can't I'm okay I... well shit's not a curse word oh right? that's two you did two that's not a curse word uh, uh, I'm you know auto my my Samsung autocorrect begs <laughs> the difference here's the thing we talked about it. We talked about when you uh, throw the Pokeball out there and how it's kind of annoying and things like that. But mm-hmm. the game doesn't have a lot of mechanics. It's up, down, and then you choose, you know, it's a JRPG. You just choose your attacks, and and that's about it. There's not a lot of mechanics to this game. There's not a lot of intricate stuff. So it's it's a fairly simple game. It's more of a, a visual... A visual, a visual game where you're just like, ah, oh, it's a visual game. <laughs> you see, folks, you see what I have to work with here. This is why. My point I... is, there's some games <laughs> that you know when you're playing it. There's a lot of intricate buttons and moves and things you got to do to execute things. But with Pokemon, it's not. That's not it. You walk around, something will pop up on the screen. And it'll be like, uh, Trainer Brian wants to fight you, and you go okay, and then you f- push A, B, or C attack. And then you go, hey, I won, of course, because it's an easy game. And then you, yeah, but you could talk about more. the sense of the world. We you know the flow of the game, how it compares. We talked new... about it not being very much open world and not starting, but after I did, not a, there's not, no, no, there's no, not a lot, no, 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 there's no, not a lot to this game. One of us just had to listen to the show. So. <laughs> people, so people, people who are listening, and if they still are listening at this mm-hmm. point, aren't like. I really want to hear what Taters has to say about the mechanics. They just I like do. when I go, pretty colors, Pikachu, zap, zap, zap. No, uh, well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a soundboard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. So you know, that's that's the thing. I do hear myself talking for long periods, and I'm like, well, I should really. I got, I'm trying to find a balance when I hand it to you, but you'll just say a bunch of nonsense. So I gotta, I gotta, yes. I gotta. <laughs> it's a how many years we do? 2012. It's a, it's a work in progress. <laughs> you, you guys should have. Some of you may have been there when I first brought Brandon onto the show, and he got so full of himself. Two episodes in, he actually put a poll out on the internet about doing his own podcast. How'd that go, Brandon? How's the, how's the uh, 
the not worth a sketch podcast going? I've got about uh, two followers. <laughs> One's Sketchcraft and the other's the Rob Duaneus account. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah. Only because uh, I have access to those. That's it. I just, I followed myself. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask about the Stan Lee stuff, which I should have put in the note, I, I really should have. See, here's another thing, folks. I, I It's been a while since I've had to make these elaborate documents in the Google Drive for the show notes. I've been making Brandon do it for the past year or so. And uh, so I'm a little out of practice. One of the things I wanted to put in there was to ask uh, Brandon, who, what would be your favorite Stanley co-creation? We'll say co-creation, right? So no one can get all mad. Like if you had, who's your favorite Stanley co-creation? Oh, it's got to be Daredevil. Yeah, I'm without right a doubt. Yeah, I'm right there. Daredevil right. is my all-time. Him and I mean, obviously Batman's not a Stanley character, but Daredevil and Batman, my two time, my two favorite characters of all time. You know, they're both dark, troubled characters. They work at night. You know, so I love Daredevil. He's my all-time favorite. I will eventually. I know Rob's against tattoos, but I will get a very big Daredevil tattoo to cover over some of my old ones I got when I was 18. I I love Daredevil. I I've always liked the the fact that he's like Spider-Man. He's always getting his personal life trampled upon, but he's still going out and kicking ass. So it's like he's a lawyer, but he doesn't make a lot of money. So he's a broke lawyer, you know girlfriend problems you know he, he falls for the wrong chick falls for the bad girl happens to be electra just he's got an annoying old... semi-obese friend <laughs> yes mm. like you're i am daredevil and you are fine <laughs> 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 yeah. yes yeah also for me uh, just aside from you know i agree with everything you just said uh you don't get the dark knight returns without daredevil and you don't get the Ninja Turtles without Daredevil. You know, like, that that book ended up creating, or, you know, inadvertently creating two of the most influential, uh, you know, comic book things to, not just myself, to the entire comics community, you know. So, like, Daredevil is insanely influential. The, the legacy of that character and... I'm amazed at, aside from the original costume being an atrocious nightmare uh, thing to look at, I'm amazed at how the core of that story still holds intact. You know, like, when you really go back Mm -hmm. to the 30s Batman, it's not anywhere near what you have today. You know, it's not the same character by a long shot. Superman, nothing like the same. Uh, To some extent, I mean, a lot of the Marvel characters kind of really held the core Marvel characters. A lot of them have held up, you know, Mm -hmm. like, and the more they go back to those sort of core ideas, the stronger the the source material becomes. I, I wonder what it would be like if, if you really made Wonder Woman exactly like how she appeared in the thirties or forties. I can't remember when, uh, probably not very good, you know, (laughs) (laughs) like it took a lot of iteration for those characters to find their center. But that's one of the things that, uh, Stan and those those guys in the '60s were able to do, you know, between uh, Bill Heck was it Bill Heck, Dan Heck, Bill Heck, I cannot remember the co-creator on Daredevil. The oh, the co-creator on Daredevil was uh, Bill Everett. Everett, Everett. right? Sorry, way off. I, I knew there was a Bill in there. So yeah, Bill Everett, <laughs> uh, you know, Ditko, Kirby, like just how how strong the uh, the triangles. Right, the emotional triangles of like Daredevil with his friends plus his, you know, personal life plus a superhero thing. Like Stanley created right. this little like triangle loop uh with these characters between their personal life and the superhero life that I mean it just that's really the genius of, of that era and what it did to change and shape comics and so I think the show the show seems to do that brilliantly. And I oh, really yeah. I really wish the turtles could find. I think it's the one thing the turtles are missing. I mean, how do you have, I mean, you don't really have a secret identity with the turtles, right? But you do get those (laughs) brothers versus their, their father thing. And I feel like the first movie gets some of that, you know, it gets some of that. It's very. Well, it does with the, the, well, the brothers getting jealous of each other, wanting to be their own, their own hero. But, 
they got to come together and realize that they they're not strong enough to do it on their own and it, it's like the daredevil like the show and the characters in general that all these you know they struggle with oh i think i can do this on my own but you're not strong enough you need your family your friends and and so forth and they do a good job of doing that like you said with the triangle you know yeah i do think though if they ever did like a live action sort of turtle series or, or anything with a little bit more depth i think bringing someone on to really flesh out the the non-ninja stuff between the the, the, the brothers like yeah. what's it like for raft to go back into his room in the sewers like what's what's his room like you know like what are yeah. The, and not in a goofy, you know, the way the cartoon is now, where it's just kind of jokey. Every three seconds is a joke. Like, you need some real. I almost feel like Jane Goldman would write that pretty well. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you need something she did like kick ass, right? Yeah, and she also did like the Home for Peregrine, that Tim Burton oh, yeah. X Men movie. I like and, that one. Yep. Yeah, and she's co developing the Game of Thrones prequel right now. Oh, on, nice. Uh, HBO. So, uh, but yeah, that's. But yeah, you get, and then you get the Dark Knight Returns because Frank Miller, you know, did his run. Obviously, you get the Elektra, Bullseye, Karen Powell, that great Daredevil stuff. But then you get the Dark Knight Returns out of that, and then Year One, all that stuff comes. When people think of the grim and gritty movement from the '90s, what they're really talking about is what Miller kind of helped start with Daredevil, transferred over to the Dark Knight Returns, and then that was so influential. All the guys that were influenced by that went and made their versions of. You know that that <laughs> grim and gritty uh, yeah. thing, and then it, that grim and gritty turns into grim dark, and then turns into Zack Snyder. Like it's just a it's an evolutionary chart, folks. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, you know, Brandon. Like, <laughs> and then we get the Lego Batman movie, you know, and then we get one of the future intros to the sketch graph theme song, which I'm personally looking forward. to. Too. You know, I might play that at the end of this uh, for the little bonus people who hung out at the very end of the show. Stick around, folks. <laughs> You'll hear just a taste of what's to come. Sketch graph. So, yeah, Daredevil's amazing. And then we, we both agree with, with Stan and that's That's the best creation, I think. Uh, a lot of people would say yeah. Spider-Man, but I disagree. Um, I put that in a second. And then the X-Men for me. I like the X-Men more than the Fantastic Four. Oh, yeah, me too. Speaking of which, I wanted to quickly bring up so, I was thinking about the villains, because we talked about Kingpin and Thanos, a little bit of Loki in the MCU and, and the TV series, and I've been thinking about how shallow the MCU villains have been, but they've been getting more complex, right? Right. And that's because in a lot of superhero films, they tend to put the villains ahead of the heroes. Happens a lot, especially the Batman movies back in the 90s did that, and kind of happened to Spider-Man a bit. Especially with right. Spider-Man 3, right? The villains take over the movie. Uh, and so Feige having... Kevin Feige having produced like 13 Marvel movies before he started the MCU, they really wanted to put the hero center and just made the villains like, you know, the thing to make the hero do the hero stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but over the course of the films, they've been getting more complex and we know the characters so well, you know, they're spending more time with the villains. And I keep thinking like, because they took that route, the best Marvel villains are the X-Men and Fantastic Four villains and the Spider-Man ones, right? So, like, mm -hmm. like I just think now they're at the perfect timing between that trajectory to, to create very complex, like, the best Marvel villains really, really are to come when they relaunch X-Men and Fantastic Four. Like, if they had had the X-Men and Fantastic Four around 2008 or nine, I don't think Magneto would have been as compelling a character in the MCU as right. he probably would not. Look, future Rob could be listening to this right now going, you <laughs> dumbass, you know? <laughs> Gee, fucking talking about it. They screwed it up, but I don't think so, you know? No. I, mean, I think these villains are going to get the right kind of... Uh, balance i mean what they did with thanos compared to ultron i mean it's night and day oh yeah you know night and day so uh but i don't know it was just a thought i had it i didn't get a chance to put into the show any thoughts on on the marvel villains or anything on that brandon anything you want to add yeah i mean i think with the the x-men movies in general they they missed the mark with a lot of the villains too where you know one of my favorite villains is um Mr. Sinister, you know, he plays 
for lack of better words, God with the genetics of all these mutants and things like that. And you miss the chance to really branch out with that. And, you know, they stuck with some, you know, saber tooth and magneto and toad, but they didn't do a great job. But, you know, apocalypse, I, which is my favorite villain, my favorite all time villain. And they, in my opinion, screwed that up. But I just hope when you move that to the now Marvel movies, you know, and with the whole evolution and things and, you know, they'll give it another try down the line. And I look forward to them using all those villains, whether it be Sentinels, you know, they did an awesome job with Juggernaut and Deadpool. So they did an okay like, job with Juggernaut and Deadpool. I wouldn't say I liked, awesome. I liked them. I liked them. But, but beyond you know, using the them, I mean, giving those characters an actual, like, arc or. Or some oh, yeah. oh yeah, that's what I'm really talking about. Not just, hey, they put in uh, Apocalypse and he looks like him, yay! Because I, I, imagine Doctor Doom, you know, the, that is the most important one, I think. Yeah, and just his his because he could he could fight any of them. He could fight the Avengers, the X Men, the Fantastic Four. You got He's like Elon Musk and Vladimir Putin hooked up, right? Like. <laughs> 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 He's a genius <laughs> dictator. So, yeah. I mean, there will be, and then you'll have that conflict. Like, that's what I think. Okay, so let me slow down here. With with Thanos, or Thanos, depending on how you say it, people liked him, and I liked him a lot because he, it made it hard to not like him because he made valid points. Like, he was a very conflicted villain, but you're like, man, he makes a lot of points, you know, and you're like, oh, shit. And I think with Dr. Doom, same thing goes. If he's introduced into the world and he's like, you know, you could have free energy. You know, Tony Stark tried to do it, but he didn't really give it to you. I can give it to you. Come to my country. You know, things like that. You're going to be like, man, this guy, is, this guy is actually a good guy. And then, you know, obviously he's a bad guy. But I think they'll do a good job of moving forward, doing things like that, like Thanos, where you're conflicted on how much you hate these villains and you invest yourself into the villain as much as you do the hero. And I'm hoping they give him a little bit more of a global platform before they make him a villain proper in the way that, you know, they introduced uh, Black Panther in C- Civil War, right? Mm-hmm. And you get a sense of the the region and, and you know, his his involvement in global politics before it turns into a giant superhero movie. So <clears throat> it'll be interesting to see all that. Um, but I just think, like, they've gone through the shallow villain phase and they're getting more complex right at the time where they're going to get a hold of some of the best villains. Right. I mean, I think one of the reasons why a lot of the villains have come off shallow in the MCU is because there's just not a lot of great villains in the Captain America roster. There's Red Skull. Uh, Baron Zemo, which they used. Yeah. I mean, look, a lot of people don't like that. He didn't look like Baron Zemo, but I think the, look, the more I rewatch civil war, the more I'm like, Great, great use of that villain. Oh yeah, you know, and so, uh, but there's just not a lot of like key. You get, ooh, crossbones. Those are fun visuals, but come on, El Diablo. Well, you want to go with yeah, most, really? <laughs> most his villains, most his villains are German Nazi stereotype type villains. You know, the Red Skull, Baron Zemo. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other the uh, US Baron, Blo- Bar- Baron Blood, Serp- the Serpent Society. Uh, what was that weird one? Bait, bait, bat truck. The fl- guy yeah. The so they me. found ways to make to put them in, but not make it. You know, they didn't try to. They didn't try to force a character arc into a shallow villain. You know. Yeah. Um, however, as they relaunch Spider Man, you get a much better vulture than you know just an old guy in a lab. <laughs> yeah. You know, like they they're getting more com- and they're and they're more complex than. Uh, your your Ultron or whatever the hell was what was the elves? What were the elves in the Thor too? Oh, the elves. I know the villain's name was Malachi. Yeah, whatever. I remember the the Forsaken or the Damned or something. Mm. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, can tell you. See, <laughs> and I worked on those shirts, and I can't tell you. <laughs> uh, Thor shirts, man. It's not a lot of fun. We are stuck on the floor. I mean, now with Ragnarok, that must have been fun, but <clears throat> I'm letting you know, like, it wasn't fun working on Thor shirts. Like, <laughs> just staring at Helmsworth's pretty face all day. You're like, this fucker. So, uh, yep. anything else? Did I forget anything? 
We 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 got everything. Oh, um, what else are we gonna have going on around here? So, gonna be some slight alterations. So, I'm gonna start scheduling the shows to see if that will bring up a live stream on the main channel. So I'm having a real hard time getting the word out that I'm live streaming. And mm-hmm. I think YouTube's forcing us to use the scheduling option. I can't just turn it on now. So, and have everyone know I'm streaming. I think I have to schedule the stream. So I'm going to give that a shot uh, this week. And I do this color pencil stuff. And then uh, I'm thinking about, so here's the thing, Brandon. You have been putting these 60-second podcasts into uh, an archive, playlist, 60-second podcast, playlist, all in order. And here's the funny thing. So when I record these for Instagram, and Instagram has a 60-second limit to video, hence Uh 60-second podcasting is kind of – that was it. Um. And people on there are constantly like, can you make a playlist? Like even Hector, like last week, was like, can you make a playlist of these? And so I'm like, they're right there on the YouTube channel. So then they go on the YouTube channel and they're like, these are too short. I'm like, you literally, like Hector did that. I'm like, Hector, you literally just asked me (laughs) to put these in a playlist. And then you come over here and tell me they're too short. Like, Like, you know how some people, you ever see those memes? Where it's like them on Twitter and they're like Rambo, and then them on Instagram they're like Bob Ross. Like mm-hmm. That's what legitimately like the same people from Instagram are Bob Ross, and then they come over here and they just turn into like Lewis Black, you know? Like like thanks, <laughs> <laughs> the shows are too short, you know? <laughs> and he's like, well, don't get mad. And I'm like, I'm not mad. Like this, I'm not. I'm not mad, Hector. <laughs> I want I want more blankets and less blankets. I'm hot and I'm cold. I want all and none. And I know they're short for YouTube. I get it. Believe me, the video the they've got like twenty views per video. I know that. It's just I need a place for these to be stored because Instagram, I don't know if you've noticed, Instagram's not a not it's not a real good repository for cataloging information. (laughs) (laughs) I have 2000 posts in my feed alone, you know, like, yeah. So, um, we're going to try a couple things. So one, maybe I'll stop having Brandon archive the 60 second podcast. Maybe. I don't know yet. Possibly. What I'm going to do is when I make a 60-second podcast for Instagram, then I'll go and just make like a five-minute version. Uh, I'll just record a five-minute version of whatever it is I'm doing for here for YouTube um, and see how that goes instead. And then, you know, if there's no point in uploading the 60-second podcast to YouTube, what's the point, you know? So, uh-huh. And then people, when they ask me if there's a playlist, I'm going to point them Maybe then what we should do is we should make a small video in the playlist explaining how it's Hector's fault, <laughs> how you all want it <laughs> needs to be archived, but Hector ruined it for everybody. You know, <laughs> so, so what you get when you suggest shit, right? I take something else. See, equivalent exchange, Brandon. That's yes. We're, we're all about that around here. Equivalent exchange. Uh, so there's that. Um, we'll see how that goes. We'll see how that goes. And then I'm going to... So I think the Mega Show will work better. First, I was thinking every other week. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, man, I, I just don't want to talk for, with you for three hours every other week. Unless, yes, I'm, ye- unless I'm yelling at you or there, yeah, there you go. calling you when you're working. I, that I yes. enjoy. But I bug Brandon while he's working. Rob, yeah. Rob will call me and say... What are you doing? And it's it's, <laughs> it's one o'clock on a Monday. I'm like, and there's hammering in the work. background. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I'm, at, I'm at work. And he goes, oh, are you busy? I'm like, well, I'm 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 working. Oh, so anyway, and then he'll just go on a story. I just be like, yeah. So I, uh, yeah, I just don't care. Like, <laughs> I'm like, All right, cool. Let me just. Uh, and 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 it's not like I'm doing that on purpose. I legitimately forget every time. 
Every mm. time. Like every I just delete mm-hmm. that out. I'll delete that out of my memory twenty minutes from now when we're done recording this, Brandon. <laughs> I, I, I have the ability. This is this is I found this um is sadly it's uh, people who suffer extreme trauma when they're children can delete like portions of you can delete memories. You can delete experiences. It's a tr- it's a survivor's uh problem. And I experienced some weird shit when I was a kid, so I can just Oh, I don't really feel like remembering that, so I don't. <laughs> uh, it's sad, folks. It's, we just took the show down. That's why I got the frowny face right there. Uh, <clears throat> it also works to works to a negative effect when I just don't feel like remembering things my wife tells me. <laughs> or the or my favorite is when you'll tell me a story and then tell me the story again two days later. And then I have to act like I have yet to hear the story, even though I know how it's going to end. <laughs> well, here's the thing about that, though. So re-listening to Kevin Smith's uh, eulogy for Stan Lee with Mark Bernard uh-huh. on the latest Bat, Fat Man Beyond. You know, he, one thing he, he described Stan having, Stan was a great salesman, salesperson, and he would repeat himself a lot. But when you're a salesperson, you repeat yourself a lot because you're always... You know, you don't know if someone's heard it the first time, but it's just, it's just a tactic. And Kevin's done that himself. And I've considered, like, do I just not repeat myself? But I think, I think I'm gonna repeat myself more. And if it annoys Brandon, I think that works for everyone's. <laughs> so I, I won't let, I won't let, on, I won't let on anymore what annoys me. I just go with it now. I can tell. Hence, hence, hence that I am now mega potato and no longer lead heavy. For those of you that did not know, I was lead heavy for many, many years. Um, no one knows that, Brandon. It was a solid. <laughs> no, because nobody would call me lead heavy. People would meet me at, at uh, art things and be like, oh, you're the other guy on the podcast, right? The the funny guy. You're the other guy. The guy that uh, Rob's always picking on. And I'm like, You ever yep. seen Blank Man? Yep. The movie Blank Man? David Allen mm-hmm. Gurr played other guy, which was the <laughs> sidekick to Blank Man. Yeah, it's Blank yes. Man and other guy. <laughs> So, Wait, David Allen Greer. <clears throat> That's a guy who needs way more credit. He he makes Blank Man the fucking oh, movie. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So you're saying that I make Sketchcraft what it is? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that wasn't an analogy. That was just praise uh, for David oh, Allen gotcha, Greer. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. It's not always about you, Taters. Eh, sometimes. So tell sometimes people again how, how you had to change your name to Taters. Uh, and so you just started calling me Mega Potato because my head is round and I'm shaped like a potato, a sexy potato, that is. Hmm. And everybody kept going along with it. And they're saying, hey, taters, hey, Mega, hey, Mega Potato. To the point where I said, you know, why fight it? Because if people are just going to remember me as Mega Potato, then what's a name? You know, what What was Nike when it was called? What is a know? man? <laughs> what, what's a, well, what's a name, really, until someone turns into some Gatorade? You know, it was just a sports drink and then. It became Gatorade. Nike was just Nike. It doesn't mean anything. It's just how you. It's a real uh, Freudian way of showing your ego. You just liken yourself to Nike and Gatorade. That's... <laughs> I, I am great. I am greatness. The Sketchcraft Mega Ego uh, Show. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was thinking too. Like I called the Mega Show only because. Uh, I don't know why. Like it's weird. <clears throat> It's, I was thinking, like, why did I call it the Mega? We, I'm doing the Making Mega Visions podcast. Why would I call it Mega Show? And I just think it was like the roll of the tongue. Like it was easier to say Mega Show than Ultra Show. Or I was thinking <laughs> Super Mario Super Show, but I didn't want to rip off Super Show, so my mind went to Mega. But it's probably because I've been working on Mega Visions, or you're called Mega Potato. That's that's why I did it. I was like, we'll make it the Mega Show because it's your show, Brandon. See. See? Yeah. I forgot. Everybody. I see I delete the I delete that too. So <laughs> No, I don't think it's any coincidence that it's because it involved you. <laughs> it's like delete. <laughs> so Mega Potato, Mega Show. Sketchcraft Mega That's how I got your name in there without saying Mega Potatoes. So that's Sketchcraft Mega Show. Sketchcraft me. first and then Mega in the background. Yeah. I I know I see how I repeated myself seventeen times so everyone knew. You know now. They know. Um, where were we going with all that? Uh, oh, yeah. So, podcast. 
uh, the, the, so what I wanted to do was in between these mega shows was possibly fill in one of those nights with like, uh, I, I guess I'm calling it drink and draw. I don't know what I'm going to call you, but <laughs> where I can stream and then people can jump in and say, Hey, I want help working this out. And we can talk about random, I think maybe random art tips. I don't know. I don't know what to call that yet. We got to think about it. But, um, I was thinking about doing the five minute thing. It's random art tips, but, but ready, can... set, random. No, you know, Brandon, don't, don't, don't name things. You're not good at this. Not worth the sketch. So, um, I hate Brandon podcast that, that I might like, but uh, you know, they're going to come on there. And we're not going to be talking about you much. So they're not going to get the joke. It's the problem with inside jokes. Uh, yeah. So something like that where I can just sketch and then people can join in and say, Hey, I'd like some help with this or that. And we can kind of go over some looser art tips. So I got to figure out how to work that out. Um, but at the end of the day, folks, I don't really enjoy teaching people how to draw. <laughs> I became uh, reminded of that this week. I got two fans on separate, separate situation, but two separate fans hit me up to ask for help with their art. And I, I, I sent them each private you know, little videos because when I type this stuff, if I type in, I'm not really, I don't enjoy teaching people. Here's how they hear it, Brandon. They hear, I don't enjoy teaching you, fucker. <laughs> you know, like that's what they hear. Like, like yeah. <laughs> you know, they're like, you didn't change, man. I believed in you. I always bought your stuff. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm gonna rip out your skull and shit down your neck. You know, like that kind of shit. Like that's what they hear. That they don't hear the. I'm not. I don't really enjoy teaching people, and I'm afraid that when I give advice, it <laughs> it sounds uh, like condescending. <laughs> yeah. I just have that natural ability to sound like I'm talking down to people, and <laughs> it's, uh, it's a talent. So. I find it personally endearing, but I'm the only one who does, apparently. <laughs> my, my wife goes, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. And, and and I don't get laid for a month. That's how that works. So so I don't, I don't enjoy making these long art tutorials. Like, here's how you can get, uh, make a scatter brush in Photoshop. I don't fucking care. You know, like if you make a scatter brush, just type in make a scatter brush. And if you want to know some stuff, everyone's got it covered. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, I mean, Trent Kanuga, he's got Trent Kanuga from Creed, not the not the band. <laughs> Before the band, there was a comic book. He was a 14 year old dude. He drew a comic book called Creed, which was really awesome to look at. I still don't know what the fuck was going on in the comic. Um, but he also got to do a Turtles crossover, which was awesome to look at as well. And he worked on Blizzard. He's got a great channel. He gives out tons, tons of awesome tips. I just, I feel like this is a place to answer things if people have questions, best I can, you know. And then set you on a way. Like I just want to steer you toward the direction, you know. I don't really feel like helping you get there. Like, and there's there's a couple reasons for that. One, I'm not there, <laughs> and I gotta help me before I help you, folks. Like, <laughs> I'm. It's how it is around here. I don't have this figured out. I take too long. I don't use. I use Photoshop. I don't use Clip Studio Paint. I don't do anything you want to do. You know, folks. Whatever you, you, especially you young artists, they don't even want to use Clip Studio Paint now. They want to use Procreate. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, I own all these programs. I own. I have an iPad Pro, and every time I draw on Procreate on the iPad Pro, I get a colossal fucking hand cramp. You know, like I, like I, uh, I'm gonna curse on that one because that 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 really hurts. I, I got every, I've tried every form of extra grip to put on the Apple Pencil to not make that. I just don't enjoy drawing on the iPad. I enjoy yeah. writing notes. I have this thing called Quick Notes, right? And I like to write all my ideas down and, and work out what I'm gonna do during the day. I like to write it out. So that's what I love. I use that iPad for that. It's okay to cuss at this point. I don't think anyone's made it this far. I got I just, you know, you know, Ryan, you know, the kids right now, they, you know, they're listening. <laughs> the four hour mark. Uh, but so, so I don't, 
But what what more art? Think about it, right? How many more art tips can I make, right? Here's how you can yeah. improve. Like I can't. I want to spend that time making like making comics people can go read, and then maybe mm-hmm. after a few years I'll come back and say, here, here's how I made all this stuff, and I'll definitely stream it. But in terms of me sitting around telling you how you can become a better artist, I mean, I, Brandon, I can't help you become a better artist. Who more do I talk and help than you? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Your artwork, I mean, it's gotten somewhat better, but, you know, it's a lot of heavy lifting yeah. on my part. Like, yeah. I, you know, it requires too much effort for me. I, I don't, I don't think it's worth it. So, uh,. But I do recognize the ability to pay it for it. So I'm trying to find small little informal ways to do that, folks. And I get that it's not going to grow the channel. I get that. But nothing grows the channel. So (laughs) (laughs) nothing I do can grow this channel. So I figure with most things in my life, the minute I stop trying, that's kind of like when it works out. You know, like, so uh, I think these are the better. Do you have any suggestions for the channel, Brandon? You have anything you want to add in? More, more mega potato. More mega. That was the last thing. I, I knew you were going to say that because I say this for the last. We're going to do tater thoughts. That's the thing we're going to do. Where I'm just going to sit back and make Brandon explain himself. Because okay. far too often Brandon likes to say, that's not, I thought about this at this time. And this was my opinion at that place. And I know that's not true. So I need to start cataloging. What brand? I need to, I need to, it's not going to help. I just want to know I'm right. Like, <laughs> it's yeah, not going to, <laughs> go ahead. No, I just, I just wanted to see where you're going with it. It's not going to stop you from doing that or. No, not at all. No, it's not, you're not going to learn anything from it, but I'll be able to just, I'll know that I'm right with proof. So, you know, there you go. We're going to do some tater thoughts. Uh, that'll be fun. And I got some music for that, too. That's going to be the best. So, hmm. Can't wait. Yeah. Anything else, Brandon? You like the, how yeah. the after show is almost as long as the entire mega show? You know it. <laughs> so, you guys are getting more show for less effort. You like that? Putting less effort, making more show. Bang for the buck. It's actually not true. Now that I have to edit this fucking nonsense together. Oh, look, I cursed it. See, this is what happened. So apparently I start cursing around the one hour mark exclusively. Yeah, once, <laughs> once, once the hour hits. Once it's like uh, 45 minutes to an hour, then you just like lose all. Hmm, I got to watch. But I got to see. I got I to gotta watch my bearing. I'm going to work on that. I'm going to work on it. Yeah, good luck with that. Hmm? I can do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I can do anything. I've seen Reading Rainbow, Brandon. I can do See, but then, I, then I'll just piss you off and you'll cuss. That's that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, go ahead. I you know ahead. me so well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't know you cared, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> I care about pissing you off. That is true. Ah. All right, all right. So with that, folks, I'm gonna put on a little, 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 little extra. Extra dark theme show for you. A little, little mega show opener. You can get a sense of what's coming up here. And we'll see you really soon on the next Sketchcraft mega show. Say goodbye, taters. Please subscribe. Hit that bell. Ding, 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 ding. Bye-bye. Three, two, one. Ah. It's gonna get mega. It's gonna get mega. Mega show time. Sketchcraft mega show. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> Cause I don't write this stuff down. It explains why I've had 14,000 people subscribing to this channel for like, I don't know, 10 years now. It, it hasn't helped. <laughs> I should probably take it more serious, do tutorials, teach you how to be a comic book artist. But I don't know how to be a comic book artist. (laughs) I don't even know how to pick stuff out to talk about. I leave that up to Brandon. The Tater Wonder. Brandon, go! Hey, all my Tater Tots. As you Mm. can hear, Rob is in a wonderful psychotic mood, and uh, I'm sure I will bring something to piss him off. If all all else fails, I'll at least... uh, 
I'll sound pretty on the podcast, but uh, yeah. Pretty stupid. He is fired up. Yeah, fired up. I'm Chris Cut. I'm loaded with caffeine and regret. <laughs> regret that I probably should have took this more seriously back in 2006. I could have been a big YouTuber. <laughs> I could have made YouTube videos with jump cuts. We don't do that here. No, we're too lazy. We don't even interview people. <laughs> I don't even do the thumbnails right. We don't even put up the schedule. You never know when we're going to stream. The Sketchcraft Mega Show starts now. Sorry. Yay. Sorry, folks. Here we go.